The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, today, uh, we are holding, really at the full committee level, our second hearing on the efficiency and cost effectiveness of the United States health care, a comparison with Canada. <clears throat> uh, we're looking at the economy and efficiency of our health system, comparing it with that of our northern neighbor. Overhauling America's health system is a critical issue because we have both a moral obligation to provide health insurance to all Americans and because of the practical need to get con cost control over the rapidly rising health costs. The crisis in health care is not just one that affects the poor, although they bear the heaviest burden, but in fact, most people without health insurance work every day. Medical bankruptcies reach deep into the ranks of middle and even upper income families. Exclusions from insurance due to pre-existing conditions or because a person has exhausted his or her benefits are the same whether you are rich or poor. At our hearing last week, Comptroller General Bowser presented a new General Accounting Office study prepared for the committee that analyzed the lessons for the United States of a single-payer Canadian health insurance system. The lesson is clear. Their system provides more quality care and operates more efficiently than our own in three key areas. The first, Canada provides universal coverage to all citizens in comprehensive care with no co-payments, deductibles, or extra billing. In comparison, our country spends 25 percent more per person than Canada and still has 33 million people without insurance, plus tens of millions of others who are underinsured. Secondly, because the Canadian provincial governments act as a single payer for health services, they reap enormous savings by reducing administrative waste. The GAO study estimates that if the United States were to provide universal coverage while adopting a single-payer framework, we'd save $67 billion in health costs, about 10 percent of our current level of spending. This savings would be enough to provide comprehensive health protection to those who like it in our country and eliminate co-payments and deductibles for everybody else. Thirdly, Canada's health costs are growing at a much slower rate than our own. In his testimony last week, Mr. Bowser noted that the United States could shave off $100 billion, maybe $200 billion per year in total health care spending if we held spending to a percentage of gross national product, similar to that of other countries such as Japan and Canada. A primary way to achieve these savings would be to adopt cost controls on hospital spending global budgets, and set fixed fees for physician service. I'm happy to say that all of the witnesses whose testimony I've reviewed today advocate universal access. The fundamental question is how to provide it and what level of benefits. And so there are two key issues that, that I'm looking at in today's hearings. First, what system should we have for providing universal access? A single-payer program, uh, some say it's not feasible and it would jeopardize the insurance company. Uh, should we require employers to provide insurance, which some have criticized as an off-budget financing mechanism that will substantially increase overall health costs? Are tax incentives and reforms to small group insurance market the best way to go? And then there's the all-payer system which reduces the number of payers but still keeps a mixture of insurance companies and public money. We would uh, be very interested uh, as a variety of our colleagues uh, come forward uh, in the beginning, this beginning hearing uh, this morning. Uh, the second thing I'm interested in is what is the best method for constraining long-term, long-run costs? As we know, health care inflation is two to three times the general rate of inflation, and if we don't get it under control, uh, we'll drive the domestic side of the federal budget up in five or ten years. The GAO report suggests we look at two main cost containment measures, 
giving hospitals an annual lump sum payment, in effect a budget within which they operate, and negotiating a set fee for physician services, uh, with variations based on local practice. Both measures will be uh, difficult to accept for hospitals and doctors, and so we have panels of each type uh, that will be joining us uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> There are a number of other uh, observations that could be made. We have uh, major bills of uh, Senator Mitchell, Congressman Russo of Illinois, Congressman Waxman of California, Congressman Sanders of uh, Vermont, uh, Congressman Stark of California, Congressman Okar of John, uh, 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 Okar of Ohio, uh, Congresswoman Johnson of Connecticut, and we have, uh, uh, for almost for sure, uh, Congressman Dingell coming forward with a bill. And then on the other side, uh, we probably have a Dashiell Danforth measure. So <clears throat> uh, the area is loaded with proposals, and we want to hear the ideas. And I yield now to my friend from New York, Frank Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join with you in welcoming the members uh, who will be testifying here today, and particularly uh, our former colleague who served with us so well here in the House and uh, uh, just recently elected to the Senate. We're glad to have you, Jim, return over to the House side and uh, wish you well in your responsibilities over on the other side. And we also want to welcome uh, Nancy Johnson from Connecticut to our uh, panel this morning. I know they'll both, and along with the other members, have some very uh, interesting uh, comments to make with regard to this very serious problem that we're facing in this country. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, their views uh, on reforming our health care system. Uh, I know, uh, as you've already pointed out, several of them have, re have uh, proposed legislation of their own, and they've done a lot of thinking on this uh, very important issue. And so I'm sure we'll benefit from their um, expertise and enthusiasm. Last Tuesday, as the chairman indicated, uh, the committee released an extremely important study by the General Accounting Office on the health care system of Canada and its lessons for the United States. I think all of us found the study to be quite enlightening. Canada's example reveals some of the steps this country might take to achieve the twin goals of universal access to health care and the manageable costs of health care. As I said a week ago, the study reminded us that other countries do some basic things in a, in a way different from us. And in this case, we should examine the differences very closely and uh, search for guidance in trying to establish our own uh, proposals. There were many things that the report did not consider, like the expensive tort system which we have in this country. The GAO's uh, estimations of cost savings proceeded on the assumption that we would adopt the Canadian model in full, which even the report did not recommend. Congress in this nation will be seeking incre incremental steps toward a system which may look something like Canada's or Japan's or Germany's or maybe be quite distinctive, but will still have many of the uh, attributes of our present system. Deciding what we will change and what we will keep um, uh, the same will, of course, be a huge political and policy challenge for this country. As we have already pointed out, uh, witnesses today are members of Congress as well as representatives of the hospitals and physicians uh, whose ways of providing service would stand to change greatly in a reformed American system, and I think it is important that we have those views spread upon our record here. So I'm looking forward to the hearing, and I want to join with you in welcoming the members who are here to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator James Jeffords is, of course, very well known to us after 14 years of distinguished service on the House Education and Labor Committee. Uh, he's been a leader in this field and is a ranking Republican member on the committee that will produce the uh, ultimate uh, health insurance legislation in the Senate. He's also been a, a, a very forthright champion of civil rights issues. And uh, we welcome you back to uh, the side of the Congress that you started from, Senator. You have a, a very uh, 
comprehensive opening statement. It will be included in the record without objection, as will all statements. And we invite you to uh, summarize your views for us. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No Better turn that on. Mics on or not here. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be with you and to work working with some of my former colleagues and uh, Frank Horton, especially the number of years we've put in here together, quite a few, and I've enjoyed every one of them. I uh, will make my uh, statement a part of the record and also a copy of the speech which is an, I was invited to give before the American Medical Association some time ago, if uh, that is all right with the chairman. Without objection, so ordered. And I will uh, attempt to summarize as best I can, Mr. Chairman. I discovered, as uh, many had, that the Canadian system is very attractive. And as opinion polls had suggested, that it's very popular in Canada. I visited there. Uh, not only uh, talking with officials that were responsible for the medical program itself, but also with doctors and with citizens as to the responsiveness of, of the public to their system and found that they were quite happy with it. On the other hand, uh, there are problems and there are differences which we should examine. It isn't perfect and I think it could benefit from changes that could be made to it. In fact, we frequently hear of Canadians who cross the border of the United States in order to receive health care. And obviously, we don't have that kind of an advantage here. Uh, we have the advantage right with us, and we, in my mind, should not do anything which will uh, deter from taking advantage of those uh, aspects which are advantageous to us. However, it does require us to take a new look at our health care system and determine as to what is best to do and to modify in order to make it a, a better system. And certainly I commend you for asking GAO to examine this and I have no problem with their conclusion that the basic, main basic change that we can make in order to incur the kind of savings we need to have more universal coverage uh, would be uh, to have a single payer system. And the program that I am developing right now is based upon the Canadian system to a, a certain degree, uh, but has advantages to it in my mind with respect to uh, taking a look at what we can provide in, in addition to that. Thus, uh, my idea is for a two-tiered uh, public-private system of care called what we call Medicore. <clears throat> the first tier is the public or Medicore package. The second tier would be composed of additional state coverage and or private supplemental insurance. In my heart, I wish we could develop a health care plan that is all things to all people. However, I know in my mind that that is impossible. Therefore, I'm focusing on developing a realistic framework which will uh, give us the advantages we presently have with our leadership in medical uh, technology and at the same time uh, ensure uh, universality for all who are presently uh, covered and uncovered. The federal government's role would be limited, uh, basically, the rule maker and the major financer. And one of the most important responsibilities of the federal government would be establish a fully representative panel of experts to determine what is that kind of basic core which would be necessary to make it equitable to all our citizens. This is going to be a difficult task, and whether or not uh, we would uh, get involved in the rationing aspects here, though I expect we would in respect to the amount of money available, uh, some of that would be left to the states in addition under our two-tier system. Expenditure targets obviously would need to be set and strictly adhered to by each state. And our goal should be to spend no more than we do at present. We believe $700 billion is enough. And we would hope that with the savings we could, uh, the some $67 billion, as pointed out by GAO, uh, would be sufficient to take care of our present problems of coverage and universality. Uh, the federal government would, would be also be responsible for establishing non-discrimination rules, portability, and health care delivery guidelines to ensure that nobody is denied access to the core benefit package. And thus, these, all these benefits would be delivered uh, to all of the people. Unlike in Canada, though, states would have the latitude to permit significant private sector involvement, allowing carriers to compete for the core plan, for instance, although the state would have the ultimate responsibility and could do it themselves for assuring the proper care is provided. I would envision that managed care strategies could be used to achieve high levels of efficiency, et cetera. The private sector would be responsible for ensuring the availability and delivery of important second-tier supplemental benefits. These benefits could be designed to wrap around the core package. For instance, and this is important because I think we have some very difficult questions of transition when we look at presently how businesses are involved. Uh, unions in particular who have bargained over the years and have received 
the Cadillac plans and uh, would not be willing to give those up. However, if we were to develop a plan where we took the responsibility of funding the core package, then that would leave that oh, total amount of compensation presently uh, being paid uh, by the businesses to be negotiated, either to be taken as a partial uh, from taxes in order to fund or for the unions and or the employees and the management to bargain as to what additional kinds of compensation they would like, which could include a, a Cadillac insurance plan. I think this is a very important area because it's a difficult one. We get into transition problems. Under our current system, the federal government already spends $200 billion on public programs and $56 billion a year on tax subsidies for employer-provided insurance and other related health expenditures. Much of the remaining burden is a substantial one lies with employers. Companies can no longer afford the 20% a year increase in health costs that we have been witnessing lately. Moreover, the management of employee health care has become a big business that consumes a considerable amount of corporate uh, resources, and we would hope to to, re to uh, improve upon that situation. Um, clearly, we cannot, in fact, we will, uh, in fact, we will take the companies out of the Medicore coverage, I want to make that clear, uh, but we would leave them in a position to assist. But it's a transition problems that we're trying to deal with now, and that is one of the most major ones. How we get equity in our tax system, which presently allows, for instance, uh, as a result of the way we funded our health care in the World War II, uh, to companies to fund uh, health care uh, which is deductible by the business but not taxable to the um, employee and yet we do not allow even tax deductions to individuals who are not uh, uh, under business. So we have a number of those problems which we're trying to deal with. Uh, nevertheless, the burden shifting and changes in our tax structure that will enable a transfer of $100 billion necessary to the fund the core system will not be easy, uh, yet well worth the transition to a fair and efficient health care system. And many of the details uh, we're presently working out, and incidentally, I am working with Senators Danforth and Daschle in this area, and we're trying, uh, hopefully, perhaps working together to come up with a bill. But uh, dealing with all of these difficult transition problems, as well as uh, the rationing problems, uh, which may or may not be deferred to the states, is the area that is holding us up at this time, Mr. Chairman. I would be most happy to answer any questions you might have, and appreciate the opportunity to be here to testify this morning. Well, thank you for starting us off, Senator Jeffords. <clears throat> you have a, a unique proposal that suggests that we have a two-tier public-private federal state uh, that you term Medicore. And <clears throat> my question goes to whether we can control costs if we have 50 states uh, running their own part of this two-tier program and how you envision that actually happening uh, efficiently? Well, in, this, in the global sense of all health care costs, perhaps we do not control it. But our approach is to control the cost of essential, uh, medically necessary health care benefits. In other words, what we would do is to ensure universal coverage and we would manage at the federal level the amount of money which expended in that which we believe society ought to offer to its citizens. But we do not deny the opportunity for people to receive more than that if they themselves as individual and private citizens or businesses desire to pay for it. Uh, that is uh, our, our approach to the global um, aspects of it. We're, uh, we allow ourselves to control the federal expenditures by the proposal. We let the states decide if they want to uh, uh, cover more, and if so, whether they want to tax to do it. And we allow private individuals to ensure that we don't uh, deter or interfere with the advantages that we are getting through experimental medicine and in the kinds of procedures which are not yet universally available. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Horton. I don't have any questions. I just want to uh, commend you, Jim, for your initiative in this, and I, I hope that um, with your efforts and others on the Senate side, we can um, get some um, um, approach to this problem which we can move forward with. Because I think the time is really uh, uh, fast uh, coming when we are going to have to have uh, some type of a program because there are too many people that are being left out of the system now and uh, the costs are just skyrocketing and it's uh, probably one of the major problems we've got in the country today. So thanks for your initiative on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you Gentleman from California, Mr. Martinez. Oh, I really don't have any questions of Mr. Jeffords except to commend him, as Mr. Horton has done, 
uh, any idea of coming forth to do anything about the lack of health care in this country, I think is to be commended. The problem I have with all of the proposals that are coming forth is that where they seem to be based on two, two issues, one is how to control the cost of health delivery, care, health care delivery, and the other is how to provide it for everyone. Uh, we don't really look at uh, places where, we look at Canada, we don't look at Hawaii. Hawaii provides universal health care for all the citizens of Hawaii, and they do it through a payroll deduction system, same as Social Security. Uh, if we are concerned about who pays for this, I think both employers and employees should pay for it, but their plan covers even those people that are not employed, because it covers everyone. And there is evidently sufficient monies coming in from that payroll deduction to do that. I don't know why we're not looking at something like that. The other problem is, is that, you know, we talk about a uh, uh, one, one uh, uh, payer system, central payer system, and we do have that to an extent with uh, our uh, government share of the, of the medical care we pay for. And that's, we contract with an agency that they determine who, what they're going to pay and who they're going to pay and how much they're going to pay, and sometimes not in a very fair way. And I think that uh, if you just want to look at that, if you develop a system much like Hawaii has, you're going to have that because the federal government's going to say, look, we're going to pay this much for this kind of health care and that's all you're going to get. And you're going to find out it's just like putting people on a budget. You tell them this is how much you have to spend and they're going to find ways to to provide what they have to provide within that amount of money. Uh, I think sometimes the solutions get so complicated here uh, because there's so much input from so many directions that we don't look at it in a very effective way as to how to reach the, pro the desired solution uh, as quickly and as swiftly as we possibly can. Uh, that's my own sentiment. Uh, I don't know if anybody shares it, but that's the way I feel about it from having looked at it and watched uh, this deliberation going on for some time, but how we're going to have provide health care for everyone in the United States. We should have done that a long time ago because there are a lot of other countries that aren't as well off as this country that are already doing it, and I think we ought to get to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just my only one little comment. I, we, are going, we are looking at the Hawaii system as well as the German, Japanese, and, and Swiss, and English uh, to try and garner the best from each of those and to put it into a final plan. So I, I understand the gentleman's comment. Yes. Thank you. My colleague knows also that uh, Hawaii has an exception under uh, RISA, the Employment Retirement Income Security Act, which is, uh, they're, we are looking at their plan as well, so I think your, your point's well taken. Craig Thomas, gentleman from Wyoming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> These are sort of opening statements rather than questions, aren't they? Let me try. Um, I'm impressed with what you're, what you're doing, Senator, and I, uh, I think um, that we need to define the package, and that's going to be a tough one, but you, you address that, and I agree with you. Given the experience we've had with federal delivery, I'd like to see us stay as much as we can in the private sector. What's wrong with defining a package which would then be a basic insurance package and let it be offered by competitive insurance companies and keep it generally in the private sector? Why wouldn't that work, even on your core package? I think uh, we would allow that option, but only for each of the single payers. Uh, I don't see how you're going to get the advantages of a single-payer system and the reduced cost if you do not reduce the number of payers and if you leave it to the large expanse that we have now for private insurance carriers. Uh, we would at least narrow it down uh, to the 50 payers. Uh, one of those conceivably could be a private insurance company under the responsibility of the state. We also leave it open uh, for what we call the second tier, that is insuring, insuring against events uh, which would provide a better care, such as private uh, rooms and that sort of thing, but also to insure against the, uh, uh, to provide the availability of leading edge technology which could not be made generally available to the public because of the huge costs involved. So we do leave that aspect open to the private insurance, but if you're going to get the basic uh, uh, cost benefits of the, the single payer one, I think you have to uh, put most of your care under a single payer system. Yes, sir. Let me. Uh, are you able to define the savings of single payer? I hear, hear that all the time, but I don't hear anybody really. You know, you you didn't spend much time on the liability costs. It seems to me defensive medicine may be even more expensive than the than the multiple payer thing. Do you have any response to that? Well, I, I would. Uh, I, we've taken a close look at both of those aspects. The the figures vary all the way from 40 billion to 120 billion with respect to the savings for a single payer. Uh, we'll, we'll take the GAO 
figure of 67 billion, which is about halfway in between uh, those two estimates. The, uh, I have also been working on trying to reduce the cost of the medical malpractice problems, but at the same time, we don't want to lose sight of the victims in that case. And uh, the question is how much you can save uh, when uh, it, I, I find, to be very honest with you, the problem is basically a one where some people get an awful lot, but most people don't get anything. So whether or not if you had a good uh, uh, tort system or uh, compensation for medical malpractice, you would have any savings or not, I'm not so sure, but you, you'd be, certainly have a better uh, handling of the kinds of costs, whether you look to a work compensation type approach or whatever. Uh, but I don't look there to have any uh, kinds of the cost savings which are necessary to take care of the problem we have. You might get in the terms of 10 to $30 billion in savings, <coughs> defensive medicine, those kind of things. Hopefully those would be received by single payer type approaches and also. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, Nancy, I won't hear yours. I've been working with you and I look forward to Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlelady from Connecticut, Ms. DeLauro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just asked that my opening statement be a part of the record. Without objection. Uh, thank you. And I want to uh, commend Senator Jeffords and uh, my colleagues, and in particular Mrs. Johnson, who was, uh, represents Connecticut uh, uh, as well. And this is a uh, kind of work that has been done here is really to tackle what's uh, the most complex and fragmented system that we have, a, a crisis that really is uh, doing in the living standards of middle class families and driving others to the edge of poverty. It's, uh, it, it, it is a system that's out of control. I just have one quick question, uh, Senator, which is on the administrative cost. Currently, our, our health care system of that $600 billion or over that we spend every year is uh, on health care costs, about a quarter of those costs, uh, about $120 billion is, is on administration, is administering it, the record keeping, the billing, et cetera. Have you done any calculating in terms of the two-tiered system um, in terms of those ad administrative costs? That's $120 billion or more at the moment that's being um, uh, dealt with in terms, as I say, of the record keeping and, and trying to, and at the moment we're only spending about $18 billion on preventive care of that money. Um, uh, can we, have you done any, any really c calculations of cutting down that administrative cost uh, with a two-tiered system? Um. Well, first of all, uh, we're looking at the governmental costs and, and, and not necessarily the cost of society generally. We're looking at what the cost should be for general universal coverage to everyone under a system which is controlled by the federal and state governments. Uh, the estimates that the GAO gave we accept with respect to the, the amount of costs uh, that could be saved by a, a single payer system. The additional costs which might occur by our two tier system would be absorbed by those who voluntarily want to pay for them and would not therefore I interfere with what uh, the control type of costs that we feel are essential for the kind of a health care system to ensure the universal coverage to, and uh, treatment to our individuals. Any kinds of, of um, if, if people were able to go into the private insurance market, they decided they wanted to do that, are there any uh, 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 controls that your system would place on, the, on those costs? Well, they would not be allowed to uh, enter into the coverage of those which we consider the Medicore. We would adopt the Canadian system there and say that the Medicore benefits uh, must be received through the, the governmental system and uh, they would not be allowed to, to offer insurance uh, uh, in the sense of, of in, in place of what is provided for under the single payer system. Mm -hmm. uh, even with what they would to be providing, what kind of care they would be providing, is there, are there any kind of cost containment uh, um, processes or so forth uh, with whatever that other extended coverage would be? No, we, we would, again, uh, we're looking, for instance, just to use the absurd, if somebody wants a brain transplant, and obviously it's not universally available, but it, they cost several million dollars. If somebody has several million dollars they personally want to spend or get insurance for it, that's fine. That would help bring along the leading edge in technology and, and fund it uh, uh, primarily from the volunteer payments from those that can afford to pay uh, rather than the taxpayer. Thank you. I look forward to the testimony of my other colleagues. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> uh, the chair is going to ask uh, after this round of questioning that each member here uh, who have committee obligations uh, take five minutes to go through theirs and then we'll question everyone 
at the same time. But since we've started with uh, Senator Jeffries, I'll ask uh, William Zeliff and uh, Scott Klug if they have any questions of uh, the Senator. I have no questions. Thank you very much. Just a quick one, Senator, if I can. Scott Klug from Wisconsin. I'm also an admirer of your energy plan that you put together with Tim Worth. Uh, tell me, if you will, what the implications of your plan is for small businesses, which, I, as I look through your opening statement, indicates employs about 30 percent of the people in the country. How do we get those small business people coverage, and what kind of financial impact does it have on them? Well, the plan would cover everyone. The question is as to how you share the, the cost of that. We have not uh, finalized the desire on that. Uh, whether it would be from an increase in uh, like FICA taxes or however we would do it for a portion of it, whether it would be uh, in corporate income taxes or value-added taxes or whatever else, uh, those are the thorny questions uh, which we're uh, uh, taking a look at now and have not come up with any plan. But the final result is that all businesses would be treated the same and that, they, that the care would be furnished uh, to all citizens in the same way and how we would recover the cost of that uh, we're presently working on. Okay, well, one quick political question, if I can. One of the other lines in your report indicates that you'd ask the federal government to help define the breadth of the program. Uh, obviously, we in this institution aren't particularly good at saying no at times. And how do we stop members of Congress from simply expanding and expanding and expanding the program, which by definition means you keep expanding the costs? Nothing that uh, I can foresee that uh, outside of a change of the form of government that's going to prevent us from Congress continuing to expand the coverage. And I'm not uh, basically in favor of changing the form of government. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Bernie Sanders, gentleman from uh, Vermont. Just delighted to welcome Senator Jeffords here and uh, applaud the work that he's doing and look forward to working with him in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlelady from Hawaii, Mrs. Mink. I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, your presence here, Senator, and thank you for your contributions to this dialogue, which I consider to be our, probably our priority concern, not only of the Congress, but of the country as a whole, and I thank you for your contributions. So good to see you again. I know. It's great to years. be back. We've missed you, and it's good to have you back. Thank you. You're kind. Senator Jeffries, thank you for starting this off, uh, and uh, please stay tuned, because this is a uh, the first of a, a number of proposals. Uh, they vary in many ways. Uh, I applaud this committee uh, that I'm privileged to chair's uh, objectivity in being willing to analyze and listen and assist the committees of jurisdiction as we go through uh, what you know better than most is a very complex uh, intertwinement of uh, economic health and political considerations. And so I thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Us I have just one comment. I don't dare not stay tuned to your committee, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. because you always have some exciting and new things to uh, either praise or worry about. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> you, you are uh, uh, courageous to submit to us, for the record, a speech you made before the American Medical Association. I'll commend it to my colleagues who may may need to uh, review <laughs> some of the material in there. Thank you. We now turn to the uh, gentlelady from Connecticut, uh, Nancy Johnson, who co-chairs the Republican Health Task Force, is a ranking member on the Health Subcommittee of uh, Ways and Means, has concentrated her efforts uh, in health reform uh, with particular emphasis, uh, emphasis on the small employer health insurance and medical malpractice. Welcome to the committee. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> My thanks to the committee for uh, holding these hearings and hel uh, helping to uh, move forward the deliberations of this body on what I uh, agree is probably the most formidable challenge that we face and will face in the next five to ten years as members of Congress. Uh, I want to say ba basically two things. First of all, I believe it's imperative that we begin dealing with this problem now. There are actions that we can take this Congress that will materially benefit our constituents and help the United States address this problem and enable us in about three years when we have pushed the national dialogue further to resolve, in a sense, uh, the final difficulties. 
But to neglect to act now, in my estimation, uh, would be uh, really irresponsible because the pace at which people are losing insurance is accelerating. It's not just those who are uninsured, it's the fact that that pot is growing. So uh, I am a real advocate of acting today, and I'm going to just very briefly focus on those things in my plan that I believe could be done by the Congress this session <coughs> with very good effect. The second thing I want to say is that we accept the GAO report without thorough evaluation at our peril. And I do want to comment on the problems in that report briefly after I review what I believe that we can and must do in the near term to address skyrocketing costs and declining access to health care in America. First of all, if we don't address costs, then anything we do about access won't matter because in a few years uh, access will decline under, for any plan that we adopt if we don't address some more honest approach to cost containment. But let me talk first about access because I think our level of knowledge is high enough for us to do several things that would be extremely significant and helpful in the area of, of access. First of all, uh, we know enough now to reform the small group insurance market. Two-thirds of the uninsured are either employed or, or uh, dependents of employed people. Now, of those employed, many are not earning very much money. So even if we reform the small group market, we aren't going to reach all of those people, and I'm not for a moment saying that we are. But nonetheless, reform of the small group market to reduce costs and make insurance affordable is extremely important and will <coughs> enable us to reach a significant number of millions of Americans. By reforming that market, and I do it in my bill in a way that's not unlike uh, what Senator Jeffords has recommended and practically every other plan, every other group that has studied this problem, I create a med access plan. And I do it a little differently than they do. I have the National Association of Insurance Commissioners do it because they are in closest touch with the states in their period of experimentation. But then I also say that any plan that, that meets our consumer protection requirements, that is, prevents exclusion for pre-existing conditions, doesn't allow insurers to drop companies that are paying their premiums and a number of other consumer protections. Any other plan that agrees to abide by those consumer protections can also be free of state mandates in that under 25 group market. So I not only put a standard core benefit plan out there nationally that would be uniform, but I also allow a competitive options by freeing up that market. And uh, that, I think, will provide us with the information, as I say, that we need in three years to be certain uh, how we move forward on that core benefit issue. Uh, that will not only reduce costs, but in combination with a bill that, Senator, uh, that Representative Chandler and I introduced recently, will allow small businesses to work together to create big groups to reduce costs. And for those big groups, we would relieve them of the insurance premiums. So we drive costs down in several different uh, fashions for that small group market. By serving that market, we reduce cost shifting, which reduces problems throughout the system. <clears throat> by providing the same tax benefits to the self-employed <clears throat> as we do for other employers. We also reduce uh, the uninsured and the uncovered and therefore cost shifting. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lastly, in the area of, of uh, access, I would, as a first move that I think we could do right away, expand the support, the financial support, for our Migrant and Community Health Centers program. In uh, Hartford, Connecticut, I recently visited a health center in the south end of Hartford. They can show me how they could serve all of the south end of Hartford with the addition of a mobile van and, uh, and so on and so forth. An absolutely definable and affordable cost. There is so much that be, could be done in urban areas with relatively uh, modest additional means. And uh, I believe expanding those centers, which remember have a sliding scale fee capability, so that they can help to, to uh, absorb the, to address the needs of employees of small businesses who can't afford the restructured uh, affordable plan that we hope to make available through the small business sector. So those are things that can be done to expand uh, access to care within 
a year, 18 months, uh, if we, uh, if we, if we uh, uh, dev devote ourselves to that goal. But to assure success of access expansion efforts, we have to do something to control costs. Certainly preventing cost shifting is one of those things, but there are three things that I would urge us to do that will uh, control costs. One is to change our current tax laws so that employers only get a tax benefit if their plan is uh, cost effective, that is a managed care structure, a co-payment structure, and there are some other options in my proposal. That will begin to, to spread managed care and those kinds of approaches uniformly throughout the system and indeed in testimony before the Ways and Means Committee we have seen the dramatic impact that managed care can have on costs. Uh, secondly, I would urge that we reform our liability laws. Uh, that will have an impact not just on uh, premiums, which is uh, money, real, mo real dollars, but more importantly on care decisions and enable those decisions to be more specifically directed at medical appropriateness than at uh, uh, defensive uh, uh, action. Then thirdly, I have proposed in my legislation something called Quality 2000, which will move our hospitals and institutional care settings toward a system that will enable us to prevent unnecessary care rather than simply deny payment for it after it is given. Those uh, kinds of approaches to cost control can make a tremendous difference, and I think we do have the evidence to, uh, to, uh, to prove that. Uh, in, the, in the GAO report, uh, we see the danger of not understanding fully our own system and not understanding fully the information that has been developed within that system as to the power of managed care and cost control. Uh, the United States, uh, it, first of all, uh, there are a couple of things I just want to mention in regard to the GAO study. Uh, C Canada is now experiencing a more rapid increase in health care expenditures than is the United States. Now, that is a, a, a statement uh, that is con uh, in contradiction to uh, the statements of others out there and is a subject in and of itself for a hearing, but there are uh, many authorities that uh, say that that is true and uh, I believe it is true as you will see from my testimony. Secondly, it is very interesting that physicians in other nations, and including Canada, pay ten times more for malpractice insurance than they do in America. Now that's significant not just because ten times the malpractice premiums is, are real dollars that are real cost, but much more importantly, what does it tell you about what medical decisions are being made in the United States versus Canada? It tells you that physicians are making many, many more defensive decisions uh, than they are in Canada because our liability system is totally different than that of any other nation. And only in the United States, for example, can uh, you sue with collateral, uh, uh, with um, uh, contingency fees. That in itself is a dramatic difference. So if you look at the rate at which costs are growing, if you look at the fact that one quarter of Canada's total health spending remains in the private sector and two thirds of the population have private insurance, and you look at malpractice premiums and the implications for the structure uh, for, co for care decisions, you'll see that the di differences between our systems are really profound. Now, let me add to that one other set of figures and then I'll, I'll close. Uh, the beds per population in the United States are the lowest of any country in the world. The days of hospital care per population are also extraordinarily low. The doctors per population are about average. What is radically different in America is the cost per office visit and the cost per hospital day. Again, what does that tell you? It tells you that we are doing more tests every time you visit the doctor, more tests when you're in the hospital, more procedures in the office and in the hospital. So unless you really are going to address procedural issues, you're not going to control costs. The Canadian system addresses those procedural issues just by capping reimbursements. That's what we do in Medicaid. That's what we have done in some other areas, and I don't believe that that will fairly uh, reduce the number of procedures. But the big problem in the GAO study, I understand that I'll get right to the end. The big problem in the GAO study is that in looking at administrative costs, it assumes that we could go to a simple system 
of uh, set fees and automatic reimbursements without any oversight of appropriateness of care, of need for care. In our system, because it is procedure heavy, because it is test heavy, the only way we have found to control costs is through oversight of appropriateness of care. And therefore, we cannot strip out that whole administrative system whose job it is to judge appropriateness without volume skyrocketing. So that the fundamental <coughs> assumptions in the GAO study, uh, and they say themselves, we don't look at the differences between the systems or the problems of uh, how we go from one system to another. So I uh, appreciate your raising the GAO study, and uh, that uh, in itself does uh, raise uh, the fundamental issues well, about the difference between our health care system and the Canadian health care system. Well, thank you so very thank much. You, 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 you raised a, a number of questions. But I wanted to ask my Ohio friends if uh, Pete Stark could go forward. He's got a chair uh, to chair a committee hearing at 1030, and he's hung in here uh, as long as he could. Uh, would, would that be all right with you, Mr. Stokes? You would, you would be next in line. And, Ms. Not only will, will I be brief, I thank my colleagues, but I'll try and be nice. And don't, please. Don't. <laughs> um, I, first of all, have decided that I'm going to start drinking maple syrup. Uh, I want to uh, associate myself with the remarks of the distinguished senator from Vermont, who I presume will probably get some support from the distinguished uh, member from Vermont. But um, the Canadian system, uh, which you are talking about today I is indeed a good system. Uh, to those of you who are worried about a further invasion of socialism from the North, uh, socialized medicine is not going to come to us through the Northeast Kingdom, nor across Lake Superior, nor down through the uh, Vancouver Peninsula. Uh, what we'll probably get will come from Germany, quite frankly. So if you're worried about some kind of a system. Uh, my great-grandfather voted with Bismarck in 1883. I hate to steal this light from, from John Dingell, but uh, my family's been identified with universal health control uh, since before they were kicked out of Germany, where they have had universal health. We are the only, the only non-third world country, save the white part of South Africa, that does not have a mandate for universal medical care. <coughs> Only country in the world. Now, it just conceivably, somebody else is doing something right in this instance. Me, try and put away three or four shillabiths that you ought to just forget when you're thinking about delivering medical care. First of all, the Republican policy of celibacy, abstinence, and exercise as a way to provide universal health care may sell in Detroit. But I want to tell you there are parts of that policy that won't hunt in Oakland. I just suggest that. But as they have a trilogy, so do I. And my trilogy is very simple, that it ought to be a matter of right. Because right now the Constitution only protects those in the slammer uh, from absence of medical care under the Fourth Amendment. Um, a matter of right, you ought to have health care. As a matter of right, every provider ought to get reasonable not necessarily desired, but reasonable compensation. And the third part of my trilogy is that we all ought to pay for it according to our ability to pay. Those of us in Congress ought to pay a lot, and those with no income ought to pay nothing. And uh, if you can abide by those three, uh, and we're going to talk religion as the White House wants to, that's my religion, my trilogy. Now, what do we have to do to get there? First of all, I am convinced no more commissions. Every commission that has been organized in the past 10 years has not had one member on that commission who hasn't had generous health insurance. And I find it difficult to put myself in the place of all of the people in your constituents that you've been hearing about who are in real trouble because they don't have health insurance or they're losing in the workplace. Let's convene a commission of uninsured people and maybe, or... Would you qualify for that? No, sir. Service. Or let's just say that we'll take all of our health insurance away for every member of Congress until we pass a universal access bill. That'll make a hundred days go very quickly. Third point, don't relate health insurance to jobs. That was done in the 40s. 
When Roosevelt said no increase in wages and the unions had to have something to bargain for, families were different. Kids anymore, if they get to their majority without having six different parents, are lucky. Um, it, it's the, and you have lawsuits and divorces over who has to pay, who gets the kids on weekends. It doesn't relate. And the only way that anybody has been able to find that we can contain costs is through either a single payer or indeed a multiple payer paying standardized rates if you insist, but a single payer is quicker. What does it do? It controls costs because everybody has to be in the game. And as long as you let one person out of the box, you will have cost shifting. It is technically, economically, accounting wise impossible to contain cost universally unless you have a single rate and a single payer. The third point that Canada and many people overlook is that there is tremendous overhead savings in a single payer. You have heard estimates of around 20 percent. I can give it to you in another way. Check with your own hospitals. If there were no bookkeeping, or if it is in Canada, they don't even send bills. But if you only had one bill, one rate, every hospital in this country could eliminate, every hospital over 25 beds, could eliminate one employee per bed. There's a million hospital beds, 20,000 bucks for the lowest price clerical employee in the world. You got 20 billion in savings right there. They estimate 100 to 200 billion, <coughs> 150 billion in savings by just having a single payer. Now, You've heard a lot about Canada and costs. You've heard a lot about studies. The AMA talked, I debated with Jim Todd last night. You'll hear about their study. Let me tell you about my study. And I did this just for Chairman Conyers. I did a study. And it's not a bad study. It's pretty fair. I had my staff last Friday call. And I just figured that maybe we ought to see what, what goes on in Canada. So we called up, and I apologize. Um, to those doctors. And we said that my father, who is no longer among the quick, uh, needed an operation. And he, um, we used two approaches. On the one hand, we said he needed cataract surgery. And on the other hand, we said he needed his prostate, a prostate operation. And um, with all apologies to those doctors who we didn't know were being put on, um, we also asked them how quickly they could, the operation would be available. In Bangor, Maine, dad could have had one eye surgerized for cataracts for $2,403. In Detroit, $2,400. In Bellingham, Washington, $2,100. And in Seattle, $2,566. Now, mind you, these next figures are in Canadian dollars, which you can buy at a 25 percent discount. In Fredericton, New Brunswick, 650 Canadian. In Windsor, Ontario, 500 Canadian. Victoria, British Columbia, 1,000 Canadian, all belonging to the highest professional society in Canada. Now, as for Dad's prostate, in Duluth, $2,000. In Bellingham, $29.67. In Seattle, $37.95. And Dr. B in Seattle, $38.33. He was in a fancier district, had a water view. Uh, St. Catherine, Ontario, 900. Vancouver, British Columbia, 800. Uh, Victoria, British Columbia, 800. And Kelowna, British Columbia, $569. Now, that, and that's, as I say, that's Canadian, not American. They all said, with the notable exceptions, both sides of the border, we said, how soon? Well, they said, in the, in the, in the cataract situation, like as soon as we can get them in for a check, maybe next week, no hesitation. For the prostate operation, the only hesitation was we first have to see whether it's malignant. There has to be an examination. Um, and it may be in Canada, they said, maybe a couple of weeks if it is not an urgent um, cancer situation. Um, dramatic differences, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and all I am suggesting is that we are, not, we are going to do nothing in this country unless we can save the employers many billions of dollars. Uh, and shift that savings to help the uninsured. There are 30 odd million uninsured, perhaps 60 million people go uninsured any time during the year. We do treat them. Only about a million families don't get treatment, but we treat them too little, too late in emergency rooms, which raises your cost of your insurance here for the Federal Government, and it raises your constituents' costs or makes your hospitals go broke. We should do away with Medicaid. Uh, don't improve on it as the AMA. We should not identify whether it is a welfare program or not. 
and I am indifferent as to what we have. We should have one Federal system for those who qualify, and the only judgment should be whether they pay for it or their employer pays for it, or if they are poor they get it free, and the doc in the hospital ought not to know. It ought to pay a better rate than Medicaid. And it, we are not going to do this under any circumstances unless we have a national leader. And the only way I can see that you get the White House to move is tack a bill like this onto the bank reform bill, which he wants and won't veto. And uh, let us turn the jurisdiction over to Henry Gonzalez and maybe we will get some action. <laughs> right. Mr. Conyers, you are doing the right thing. Uh, please uh, keep uh, the Administration's feet to the fire. Uh, as I say, prayer may help, uh, but the other part of their trilogy I don't believe is going to do it. We have to, we have to get moving. Thank you. Well, I am I'm glad you didn't have to rush off to chair your meeting because uh, we, were, we were treated to a real exercise in uh, uh, analysis and experience that you bring as the chairman of the committee that is probably going to uh, produce the product, Pete. And I am delighted that you would add your comments uh, to the hearing this morning. Uh, if you can stay for questions, please do. Uh, if not, the uh, hearing record will be open until June 30th, and uh, we can submit questions to all of our colleagues, and they will uh, return them back in, to us. If the Chair would permit, in deference to the dignity and prestige of the Committee, I have prepared a uh, statement yes. that is properly spelled and punctuated, which will add some dignity to the record that well, your grammar has always been impeccable as long as I've known you. Going that it back be included to in the, the record, 70s. and it may supersede my statements if the chair wishes. Yes, thank you very all, much. All the re all the statements have already been accepted into the record, including yours. Let me now turn to uh, the uh, ranking member of Health Appropriations Subcommittee, my dear friend Louis Stokes who has been the past chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, chair of the Select uh, Committee on Intelligence, uh, was on the Pepper Commission, is co-chair of the Democratic Caucus Health Issues Task Force, and chairs the 1,500-member uh, Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust since 1977. He's been uh, involved in uh, legislation uh, dealing with the current critical shortage of health care to minorities for many years and the original sponsor of the Disadvantaged Minority Health Improvement Act. Welcome, Congressman Stokes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, at the outset, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you uh, and the members of this committee for affording us this opportunity this morning to have this forum to discuss what I think is one of the most important subjects in this country. And I certainly commend you for your leadership, along with Mr. Horton, uh, for his leadership in this area. <clears throat> I've just spent uh, a year as a member of the Pepper Commission, along with uh, my colleagues Mary Rose Okar and, and Pete Stark, who just testified here. Um, and I happen to think that, that the work of that committee is a springboard for national discussion on health care reform. I think it's important for this committee to know why that, that commission proposed a shared public and private plan instead of choosing to develop a national health insurance system such as that of Canada. Uh, now, in fact, uh, I personally prefer, prefer a more social insurance type system than that which was recommended by the commission. However, the commission concluded that although there are some 30 million Americans without health insurance, health care coverage with employment is firmly linked in our nation. Eighty-five percent of our citizens are covered by insurance, most of whom receive it through their workplace. If we were starting from scratch, we might not have chosen to tie health care to employment. But we are not starting from scratch. By choosing an employer-based solution, such as that of the Commission, we have chosen an option which is least disruptive to individuals and to our health care system while ensuring universal access. Moreover, we must recognize that there are some positive aspects of our system that should not be discarded. In the opinion of the Commission, the realistic course was to start where we are and then to improve upon it. There are, however, some lessons to be learned from other countries like Canada with a national health plan that are incorporated in the Pepper Commission plan as well as in initiatives being considered before Congress. Most important of these are universal coverage, cost containment, uniform payment system, and quality assurance. 
We also need to seriously address the issue of malpractice and how defensive medicine has resulted in astronomical costs to our health care system. All of these points were highlighted and noted in the General Accounting Office report that compared the Canadian system with ours. I happen to fully concur with the conclusions of the GAO report. Now, Mr. Chairman, I could not testify today without discussing a major issue not specifically cited in the GAO report in which I have a particular interest. That is the health status of underserved minority populations. The issue has become even more critical since for the last three years there has been a decline in black life expectancy at a time when white life expectancy has continued to increase. In fact, a 1985 uh, report of the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health concluded that despite an unprecedented explosion in scientific knowledge and the phenomenal capacity to treat and cure disease, minorities have not benefited fully or equitably from the fruits of those health systems. More recently, an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association recently took the position that our health care system is based on, quote, long-standing, systematic, institutionalized racial discrimination, close quotes. When talking about national health care reform, we must remember that having universal health insurance does not guarantee the actual receipt of care. There are cultural, linguistic, racial, educational, and attitudinal differences that impose special barriers to effective delivery of health care to minority Americans. Steps must be taken and provisions made in any health care reform plan that addresses these special needs. These provisions should include both fiscal and other support for community health clinics and other local health providers. It means making services physically accessible to hard to serve populations and providing health professionals trained and sensitive to these special needs. It means that when promoting medical research, the federal government focuses its efforts on disease and health problems that affect minorities, as well as treatment methodologies that are specific to minority needs. Moreover, the federal government should increase support for programs of health promotion, disease prevention, risk reduction, and health education that increase healthy lifestyles and reduce excess mortality. Mr. Chairman, without these advancements, national health care reform as it is currently being debated will not truly assist minority Americans. If this nation can begin to make even the slightest inroads to the health care problems of the most severely underserved and ill, then solving the problems of others is certain to follow. No matter how difficult the road ahead, we must not be swayed from our goal of ensuring quality and affordable health care to all Americans. It's going to take the collective will of all parties to give to the solution and to effect change. Mr. Chairman, let me close by saying that I'm confident that reform will come. What it comes down to ultimately is not whether something will be done, but when. I look forward to working with you and this committee in effectuating this change, and I'll be glad to attempt to try and answer any questions you or the panel may have. Thank you for an excellent statement, Chairman Stokes. We now turn to one of our most demure members of the House, Mary Rose Olcar, who joined us in the last panel. Uh, her work in this subject matter has been underscored by the fact that Medicare now has a mammography benefit in it that it didn't have, and it took years for her to do it. She's a Pepper Commission member and uh, has introduced her own legislation and was with us uh, last week uh, when we uh, unveiled the uh, General Accounting Office study on Canadian system. Welcome again to the committee, Ms. Okar. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. And I'm so pleased to be on a panel with individuals uh, who are on the front burner uh, of this subject. And Mr. Chairman and members, I want to publicly thank the Government Operations Committee because I don't want to wait eight more years as it took me to get mammography coverage, one little item. 
uh, folded into Medicare to save lives and save a lot of money, as a matter of fact. Uh, I want to see uh, a solution to what I think is a crisis uh, in our country relative to, to health care. Uh, your, your work and your uh, asking for the GAO report was absolutely invaluable and maybe finally we will put health care as an anchor issue uh, to be confronted by Congress and the administration because the American people are way ahead of Congress and way ahead of the, uh, the administration on this issue. They want it. They are fed up with the system as it is. They cannot believe that they are, we have 77 million people underinsured and non-insured and 8 million people who, who need long-term uh, care. And yet, Americans spend more than any other industrialized country on health care with all these under and non-insured people. And so, as a member of the Pepper Commission, we did look at options. And I want you to know that of the three options we looked at, the Pepper Commission proposal, which is Congressman Stokes, my distinguished colleague who contributed so much to that commission, uh, indicated we recommended by an 8 to 7 vote uh, an employer-based plan building on what we already had. But we all, there were other options offered, and I think you ought to know this. We, someone offered on the commission a subsidized uh, plan that would improve access to private insurance uh, under the guise of expanding Medicaid. And then I offered my universal and comprehensive health care plan, which is now a bill, H.R. 8. Um, <clears throat> and um, I want you to know that of the three plans, uh, my vote was 9 to 6. It was kind of close, and we almost won it. But nonetheless, of the three plans, uh, mine was the cheapest and, and provided more comprehensive access to every American. So that is what I would like to briefly discuss uh, for a few seconds. What does the plan do? I want to reform health care in this country in two manners comprehensively. Number one, I want every American, irrespective of who that American is, to have universal, comprehensive coverage. And number two is, it's not enough to just say we want an insurance policy for Americans. I want every American to have a very high standard of coverage. I want every American to have comprehensive acute care, in and out patient care coverage, which is all part of my bill, the kind of care we associate with respect to surgery, hospital care, etc. I want every American to have uh, preventive health care, which I defy anyone to tell me what policy in this country provides comprehensive early detection preventive health care. That is, I want to have every child vaccinated, every adult uh, have immunization, which is not covered in, in, in regular uh, health care uh, coverage. Why is it that we have 100 percent more infant mortality than Japan? Uh, in, 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 and I can tell you one good reason. One reason is that they have child vaccination and wellness programs yeah. as part of their uh, health care coverage. I want to see, in addition, uh, other early detection and preventive meds. I want to see mammography coverage, not just in Medicare or cancer screening for men for prostate cancer and colon cancer, which is more uh, susceptible to men, hypertension, sickle cell anemia, which Congressman Stokes put into our plan uh, as, as amendments, um, and other kinds of diseases that are especially uh, uh, impact on minorities and others. Uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, we can do it, and we can do it better. I want to see women have pap smears, not if they have some cat so-called Cadillac plan, but that ought to be standard coverage, standard coverage. And Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, I want to see another form of prevention, and that is why in H.R. 8, which I introduced at the beginning of this Congress and right after the Pe Pepper Commission adjourned, uh, that is why I have added a billion dollars in more research. Why is it, for example, breast cancer notwithstanding, because you get me off on that and I could really take a lot of your time and I don't want to do that, but let's take Alzheimer's disease. Every year, Americans spend $90 billion 
trying to take care of their loved ones and there is no cure for it. And yet scientists and others are so close to finding what triggers that sell off in the right, wrong direction. Why can't we invest in finding cures to diseases? And that is part of a preventive health care uh, approach that our country ought to tackle. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to see comprehensive long-term care. That is, I want to see home, home and community-based care services, uh, homemaker services, heavy chore services, respite care services, dietary aid care. I want to see prevention in terms of treating people who are alcoholics and drug addicts instead of building more prisons. We ought to find, arrest those diseases, and yet we don't even do anything in this country. And I'm not exaggerating about alcoholism. It's not even on anybody's agenda. And yet we saw the report the other day that young people, 12-year-old children, are uh, many of them uh, imbibe you know, at a rate of 15 drinks a week. And yet we don't want to talk about alcoholism because of all the lobbying that goes around around this place, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to be able to treat those people so that they don't get t more catastrophic diseases. Um, and Mr. Chairman, the fact is that if we have a long-term care strategy, we can supply up to six months of nursing home care uh, and, and do it, uh, and the average length is four months. And, and Mr. Chairman, finally, uh, we can do all those three areas, that is acute care, long-term care, and preventive care. And the question then becomes, and I'll conclude with this, how do we pay for it? The answer is, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, guess what? We already pay for it. We already pay for it. Um, we pay $700 billion. Uh, Two-thirds of that are government programs. So don't let anybody kid you about the government being not being involved in, in this, they, we already are. Mr. Chairman, a real easy solution, and then we spend $209 billion in um, private insurance. Let me tell you something. You wouldn't have to spend one more nickel on health care, and you could have this comprehensive approach or other approaches very similar. You know how you could do it tomorrow if you wanted to? You could recapture, as Senator Moynihan wanted to do, uh, he wanted to take part of the surplus in Social Security, give it back to people. Well, I would take, I would take the surplus, take the surplus, which now is about $225 billion. Uh, and um, this is just one approach. There's a million other different approaches. Well, we'll, we'll get into those probably doing the questioning, Ms. Okar. Okay. Right uh, now, I want to thank you for again coming forward with a a, a statement that shows that you've been in this a long time and are going I to help us the time restraints and I appreciate that, formulate a solution to it. Okay. Let, me, let me now turn to uh, the gentleman from Illinois who is the number two man on the health subcommittee of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Marty Russo, who has introduced a bill that will establish universal single-payer health care uh, it's a bill in which uh, 10 labor unions, 40 co-sponsors have joined with, uh, and we know that he has been working uh, in ways and means with uh, hearings, a retreat, more hearings, and uh, we're anxious to uh, hear your analysis of this very difficult problem. We welcome you, Mr. Russo, to the Government Operations Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate having this opportunity to testify before my colleagues on the Government Operations Committee about my bill, H.R. 1300. Everyone agrees, even the people on this panel agree, Mr. Chairman, our health care system needs reform. A universal single-payer health care system is the obvious answer to our nation's health care dilemma. According to the GAO report released last week before this committee, shifting to a single-payer system would save the United States $67 billion in administrative costs alone. I would say that would be a conservative estimate. There are some estimates that say it can save us up to $100 billion a year. Insurance overhead would be cut by $34 billion, while hospital and physician administrative costs would be reduced by $33 billion. Furthermore, the GAO anticipates substantial savings through global budgeting, fee schedules, and controls on expensive technology. 
these savings would be more than enough to finance high quality health care for all Americans and to eliminate all co-payments and deductibles. The legislation that I've introduced would implement the key features supported by the GAO report. H.R. 1300, the Universal Health Care Act of 1991, would establish a universal single-payer program which would cut the nation's health care costs while guaranteeing comprehensive, high-quality care for all Americans. Let me make this clear, Mr. Chairman. My proposal is not the Canadian system. It's an American system. It's about the things we as Americans hold dear and have come to expect. Freedom of choice, quality care, and the efficient and fair use of our hard-earned dollars. This bill is about containing costs because Americans cannot afford to pay $5,500 for every man, woman, and child by the end of this decade. Above all, it's about giving Americans the peace of mind peace of mind that they deserve so that when their children are sick, they can take them to the doctor without having to worry about paying a high deductible. Or that when they change jobs, they won't lose their health insurance. Or that when their mother or father needs long-term care, they won't have to mortgage their home or postpone their kids' college education. Or if they develop a condition during their employment, that if they change employment, they will not be denied coverage in seeking another job. Or if their child develops a ch children's disease before they're 18, that they won't be covered and uninsurable after, the, after they turn 18. These are the kind of things that we have to give Americans peace of mind about. And under the current system, they don't have peace of mind. They have high spiraling costs, not as good quality care for all Americans, and they don't have peace of mind. We can't afford to do anything less than single payer, Mr. Chairman. Partial solutions like insurance reform or mandated benefits won't work. And they won't work because they would allow the insurance companies to administer health care. Insurance companies would continue wasting billions of dollars on paperwork and would be unable to implement meaningful cost containment. As the GAO has testified, the only way we will ever slow health care inflation in the United States is through comprehensive reform. And as the Congressional Budget Office testified before the House Ways and Means Committee, single payer is the only system that can provide high quality health care to all Americans without, and I stress without, increasing the amount we spend on health care. Americans trust and respect their doctors and nurses, but they are fed up with the wasteful way insurance companies manage our health care. We need to get the insurance companies out of the medical profession. We need to get the insurance companies out of making medical decisions for our patients. We need to make sure that insurance companies don't have pre-certification anymore. You have to call to make sure it's okay to go to the hospital if you need an operation. Otherwise, they'll deduct $500 from, from your bill. Uh, we need to get rid of pre-existing conditions. We need to make sure that if Americans are sick, they get the help they need, not forms and, and, and obstacles that stop them from getting health care. That's what H.R. 1300 is about. It's about universal access. Opinion of polls indicate that 89% of Americans believe our system needs fundamental change. Not surprisingly, a majority of Americans say they would prefer the Canadian system, even if they didn't know what it was, where the government pays most of the costs to the U.S. system. When asked the question, would you prefer the Canadian system versus the U.S. system, they didn't tell them what the Canadian system was. 61% said they prefer the Canadian system. That tells you about the confidence of the American public as in the current system that we have. You know, Mr. Chairman, you've heard this because you've had testimony. We have this called thing I call the be inside the beltway mentality. They say the single-payer system is where we ought to go, but it could never happen now. We don't have the political will. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, the American people want it, and they deserve it. And they ought to demand it of the Congress and of the President. For the amount of money that we spend in this country, 12.2% of our GMP, no other nation in the world comes close to spending that amount of money. Americans should be living two years more than Canadians rather than two years less than the Canadians. 
H.R. 1300 has the support of 40 members of Congress, including the distinguished chairman of the Government Operations Committee, as well as 10 major unions, several consumer activist groups, including Citizens Action, which helped tremendously in putting this legislation together, the National Council for Senior Citizens, and the Physicians for a National Health Care Program. My proposal offers the framework for how health reform should be structured to guarantee that America truly has the best health care reform system in the world, not just the most expensive. I look forward to working with you and welcome your suggestions and suggestions of the members of your committee, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have on the subject, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Russo. I, I can't help but think that uh, all four of you have now made an, a number of similar points. Uh, we haven't heard from our colleague Bernie Sanders yet, but he's a member of this committee. Uh, I call on him now uh, as the mayor of Burlington, Vermont. Uh, he's worked in the health care field for many years, set up a joint U.S.-Canada health care study, and now has his own bill and has been working very, very closely with this committee to help formulate a way to initiate the kind of change that we've all advocated. We welcome you before the committee as a witness, Mr. Saunders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, let me say I have a statement which we've just passed out, and I would appreciate it being entered into the record. It will be. And like other spokespersons here, I really want to congratulate you and Mr. Horton and other members of the committee for your request of the GAO to finally raise the issue of how does the American health care system, or non-system as it may be, stack up with the Canadian system. So I, I congratulate you for asking for that report, and I congratulate them for their excellent work in presenting it. Mr. Chairman, there is a statement in Vermont that goes as follows. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mr. Chairman, the current health care system in the United States is broke, and it can no longer be tinkered with. We can no longer apply Band-Aids to it. We need a new system. Now, having heard all of the other testimony, frankly, there's not a whole lot that I can add. But let me say just the following. The problems of the current health care system are enormous. It is a national shame. It is unacceptable, as Mary Rose Ocon mentioned, that there are over 80 million Americans today who either have no health insurance or only partial insurance. It is unacceptable that despite Medicare, millions of our elderly citizens are spending substantial sums of money to provide for their basic health care needs. It is unacceptable that in this country, prescription drugs cost 62% more than they do in Canada and 54% more than in Europe because those nations have a national health care system that is able to negotiate with the drug companies rather than taking the prices that these people are giving us. This is the United States of America. And while we see huge parades honoring the Persian Gulf War, we should also remember that this country ranks 22nd in the world in terms of infant mortality. And in some of our ghetto areas, you're talking about third world statistics in, some, in terms of some of the poorest nations on earth. That's the comparison. In terms of life expectancy, we rank 12th. Now we have heard a lot of discussion between the Canadian system and in the American system. And I think no one denies that the Canadian system does have problems. We have heard that in certain provinces there is lack of technology. That is true. We have heard that in certain provinces there are waiting lines for certain medical procedures. That is true. But what should be pointed out and emphasized many times over is that we in our country, for a non-system which is failing us all along the line, are spending 40 percent more per capita than the Canadians. 40 percent more than the Canadians. And it seems to me that if we chose to level fund health care at the level we're presently spending, $756 billion, we can in fact alleviate and, and, and do away with many of the problems that the Canadian system has, and in fact moving toward a Canadian-style single-payer system, have in fact the best system in the entire world. 
Last week, uh, I introduced H.R. 2530, uh, and let me go through very briefly uh, some of the aspects of that bill. Number one, it unabashedly, unabashedly establishes a Canadian-style system of universal, comprehensive health insurance through state-enabling legislation. To be very honest with you, we have relied very heavily on the Canadians because we think they have a good system. We can make that system better by putting more money into it. But basically, we think that they have a system that is working pretty well. Under the program that we are advocating, we will have universal coverage, which will be provided for all basic medical needs, as in Canada, for physicians, for hospitals, for nursing homes, and for home care services without out-of-pocket expense. Finally, I think as Mr. Russo and others, Mary Rose Okar, have said, Finally, we will reach the stage when people will be able to go to the doctor, go to the hospital, and not worry about what that bill is going to be. Studies indicate that 25 percent of Americans delay going to a hospital or a doctor because they're afraid of that bill. They don't go. And that's a brilliant strategy because when you don't go, they get sicker, and then the cost is that much more or they become that much more ill. Now, what is perhaps uh, a feature of our plan that may be a little bit different uh, than uh, Congressman Russo's or anybody else, is that in fact we really do adhere pretty closely to the Canadian style in this sense. What we suggest is not the implementation on a given day of a 50-state system. What we suggest is to in fact do it the way the Canadians did it. And that is that after World War II, Saskatchewan began the ball rolling by moving toward a provincial health care system. What our program does is give financial and legal incentive to those states, those states who are prepared to come forward and meet the following five criteria. Number one, a single payer public administration. As Mr. Russo and others have said, there can be, in my view, no more debate about that issue. This country can no longer afford 1,500 private insurance companies who are wasting, the estimates are, between $67 billion and $100 billion a year in terms of billing, in terms of administrative bureaucracy. The obvious advantages of a single-payer system are extremely clear, and the states must establish a nonprofit, publicly administered single-payer system. Second of all, the program in any given state must be universal. All people, rich or poor alike, are going to be treated the same way. That has got to be the case. It cannot be, in my view, a two-tier system. Either we will say that health care is a right for all Americans, rich and poor, or we will not. And I will not support legislation which does not say all Americans are as important as anybody else, rich and poor alike, universal health care. Also, it must be comprehensive. It must cover all basic health care needs, as does the Canadian system. We are not talking about cosmetic surgery. We are not talking about wonderful programs to make you handsomer and more beautiful, but we are talking about basic health care needs, as do, as do uh, the Canadians. Um, it also, of course, must be accessible, and the f hospitals or physicians cannot provide extra billing. No out-of-pocket expense. Now, we see certain advantages in this program. First of all, to be frank, and this is really what the bottom issue is, and I think Mr. Russo, others have touched upon it. The people of the United States are disgusted with the present system. They want to move forward toward a national health care system. In my judgment, the United States Congress and the President of the United States appear to be the last people in this country to understand that reality. In Vermont, all over this country, the people want to junk the present system. They want to go forward. The bottom line really is it's not a health care debate, frankly, Mr. Chairman. It is a political debate. Does the United States Congress have the courage, the political courage, to stand up to the enormous political power of the 1,500 separate insurance companies, the drug companies, the physicians, the specialist physicians who are making very large salaries, the medical equipment suppliers who are telling every hospital you've got to get the latest piece of new equipment while they make billions of dollars in profit? That is what the issue is. Do we have the political courage to go forward? And I have to frankly tell you, I do not believe that the United States Congress has the courage to do that. So I think that the- Not even with you here now? Well, we're trying, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, but it is a hard process. So I think, and, and perhaps this is the only difference that, that we have with Mr. Russo, 
is that I think that the fastest way to move forward is to give the financial incentives and the legal rights to those states that want to move forward. And that's what the Canadians did. So if California or Michigan or Vermont goes forward, I have news for you. I think New York State and Ohio will not be far behind because the people will come up to their governors and their representatives and say, hey, it's looking good in Vermont. Why don't we do the same? And I think the state legislatures and the grassroots of this country are far advanced of where the Congress is. So I think as a political tactic, I think we should move forward in the state by state way. Also, and lastly, in terms of administration, uh, I think there are many people, including the physicians, who would prefer to see the health plan administered at the statewide level rather than at the federal level. And that, of course, is what the Canadian system does. As you know, there is no one Canadian system. Each province raises the money that they need in a different way. And I think that that's right. I think we should build in that flexibility. So let me simply conclude by congratulating you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Horton, and the entire committee for beginning what I believe, and I agree with Mary Rose Okar, this is the most important discussion that the American people want to hear. And they want to see us move forward, and I hope that we will have the courage to do the right thing as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Well, Chairman. Well, thank you all. Uh, isn't it true, though, we have broken the logjam of silence? Uh, and the Pepper Commission served its function. Ways and, and Means Committee is holding hearings. Uh, we put benefits of uh, Stokes and Ocar into Medicare legislation. Uh, we have at least 100 members on some form of reform bill. And it seems to me that we're now moving along. We're holding these hearings. There are more coming up in, in many other committees. There are at least uh, three more bills coming forward. So it seems to me that we have commenced uh, with taking care of what it is you were doubtful that we would, we would do. I think we're, we're moving in that direction. Mr. Chairman, I agree. I would there is nobody here that's not for universal single-payer system, as I understand uh, your testimony. Uh, if we were deciding this in this body right now, there would be very uh, few matters, and they wouldn't be small, but there, there would be a lot to which we could agree. And I, I think that's fair to say about the four members who are leading this discussion yourselves as witnesses before this committee. Mr. Chairman, I, I think the problem that we face, unlike it in the 70s when we had this huge capacity to grow, nowadays we have overcapacity, and we need to now take advantage of that and move forward. This idea that the Congress doesn't have the will is pervasive inside the Beltway. When you leave the Beltway and you go out to the various states, and I'm sure your state and the states of every member of this committee, if you ask people if they want universal health care coverage, I don't care what, what the category they're in, rich or poor, they want it. They think the present system doesn't work. And so the bottom line is, even though we may have 100 different members involved in different pieces of legislation, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get it passed. And I think what's important is that we need to make a bold stroke here. We need to make at least one major decision, and that will set us all off, and that is single payer. When you make the decision that you're going to single payer in this country, that sends the right message. Then it's only a matter of time. And I think uh, not only should we have hearings, but I would like to hope our leadership in the House of uh, would come forward with a major plan that single payer, because there's no way you can reform the current system cheaper than single payer. Anything else we do, mandated benefits, managed care, uh, medic uh, expanding Medicare, all those are Band-Aids. And the longer we rely on Band-Aids, the greater the cost, the greater the increase in expense to the public and the less coverage we have. It seems to me that every time we, put, we slap on a Band-Aid, we deny somebody else coverage. The average American who has health insurance is being priced out of the business of providing for themselves. If you're a small businessman in this country, as much as you may want to get health care insurance for your employees, you can't afford it because it's anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of your payroll. If you're big enough, you can spread it. Right. But if now, you're the average person, you have a problem. Now, the, the biggest challenge to single-payer, since we're getting down on the table now, 
is the employer mandates, is, is that we have employers being required to provide health care or else buy into a public plan or pool. I'd like to ask my colleague, Mr. Stokes, has, has he given consideration uh, to that kind of plan as how it would stack up uh, against uh, a uh, single-payer system? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, that was the recommendation of the Pepper Commission. And uh, as I said earlier in my, in my formal testimony, that uh, the Commission thought that perhaps it was better to build upon the current system rather than to reinvent a new system and the disruption that would occur uh, throughout the entire health system. Uh, in looking at that system, we also um, considered those individuals who don't have access to insurance. We talked about uh, the homeless. We talked about uh, those who work as domestics, well, those who, who work in um, the type of, of employment that is outside of the general circuit. Um, and basically, the Commission really felt that we could take that type of a system, uh, require the employer to, uh, to, to take out that type of insurance, and then uh, pay into a pool, those who do not pay into a, a federal pool, out of which we would provide the insurance for those uh, uninsured employees. I think the system, that, that system does have merit. I think that... Uh, uh, we could continue to build upon that type of a system or some uh, variation of it, but uh, uh, at least it would be a move, I think, in the right direction. Mr. Chairman, can I come but, on it, comment on that? Please. I think mandate of benefits, and I, I know the Pepper Commission was divided. It was tough right. to, reach these, uh, to reach a conclusion because they had a problem paying for anything, and nobody wants to raise the word taxes. But under a single payer, you save so much administrative cost that you can give universal coverage for less money. Mandate of benefits gives no relief. It mandates that the business have to provide the coverage without giving any relief. You still have the 1,500 insurance companies. You still have the administrative burdens. You still have cost shifting. You still have high inflation. It doesn't solve the problem. It's what is known as a nice little way of pushing it under the table and waiting for the explosion to happen later on, and then you'll eventually come to single payer. I mean, it, it's what people tell me well, Marty, we got to take this in increments. This is the next increment. But, Mr. Chairman, this is a very expensive increment because without major insurance reform where we tell the insurance companies how much you can charge small businesses, how can small businesses play? They'll have to pay. Well, if the care providers uh, under employer mandates are still calling the shots as to who right. Will, right. will be provided service and at what price and who will That's not, right. It seems to me that perhaps the Pepper Commission should have considered the, gl the global budgeting and the limits on physician fees, which <coughs> is another crunch in terms of really saving that. Uh, Mr. Stokes, was there consideration about that in terms of how the fees could be limited? Uh, yes, there was, Mr. Chairman. Let me tell you the practical problem uh, that commission had. Uh, the chairman attempted uh, working with everyone on that, that commission to try to be able to get a plan out of that commission. Uh, he had one hell of a job. Uh, as as, as con my colleague, Congresswoman Mary Rose Okar said a little while ago, uh, the final vote was an eight to seven vote. And, uh, and, and at the same time, the the chairman was operating against uh, an administration that did not want any plan to come out of that commission and was heavily lobbying um, the members of that committee not to vote for a plan. And um, so, so the answer is yes, all of these ramifications were discussed, but we were under a very difficult political situation and we felt that uh, the obligation was to pre present to Congress some type of a plan in order to start moving forward and, and to show some progress. Uh, and while the plan that was finally came out was not the best option all of us would have liked, uh, I voted for uh, Mary Rose Okar's option. Uh, 
Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of her legislation. I thought that would have been the ideal plan to come out of our commission, but the chairman would have never gotten the votes for it. Right. Ms. Oker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I think Congressman Stokes has given you a very objective appraisal of, of what the political ramifications were uh, with 15 members of a commission appointed by then President Reagan and the leadership of the House and Senate on both sides of the aisle, it was very, very difficult. I did end up, I, I think I was a swing vote because uh, they accepted 13 of my 15 amendments relative to prevention in long-term care uh, and some global responsibilities um, as well as allowing me a vote on my plan, which was a 9 to 6 vote. Uh, but I think I would add one caveat to the discussion that has not been brought up. Uh, and that is, in my plan, I, I do it a little, I believe very strongly in a single payer system. I absolutely think it saves money and, it, and, it, and believe it or not, the government does it more efficiently. We studied that. We could give you all the statistics you want on how efficiently the government does it compared to private insurance companies. In my city of Cleveland, our city of Cleveland, Congressman Stokes and I, we don't have any longer any health insurance programs in the private sector that are not for profit. When I was growing up, they were all not for profit. Blue Cross was not for profit. Sure, they paid all their employees, all their expenses, all their everything, but they didn't come out with a profit. Today, they diversify, not just Blue Cross, all the private insurance plans, at least in my county, they diversify, and as a result, their administrative costs are tremendous, over 20 percent compared to less than 10 percent for the government. But here's what I would do, and it's based on what we do for federal employees and retirees. I would keep the not-for-profit insurance programs in the ballpark. In other words, I would have a single payer. I would set the high standard. They would have to have a minimum standard of coverage for every American. And state by state, I would let the private not-for-profit companies, and they could be unions as we have in the federal employment system, they could be regular companies, bid on this high standard. And I think their competition would be good. We already have examples of how uh, the private sector is involved in Medicare. They're the ones that make, and so forth. But I would make sure they were not for, for profit. And I think that that's a different avenue. So that you're, you're saying we could have a single payer private sure. insurer as opposed to a government. Uh, and we no, could no, also no, a have single payer federal. The federal government would be the single payer. We would pay, but based on what we would pay for this high standard of coverage, I would let not-for-profit insurance companies bid on the high standard single-payer federal government system. And you know, I so think it would be So you could have a great. private single-payer if, they, could, if they bid you and, have and a won. Sort of a private-public partnership, mm -hmm. but here's the thing that would happen. But they would have to be not for profit. Here's what would happen, Mr. Chairman. You'd have, as we have had in the federal employment system, you'd have a lot of companies trying to outbid each other to get in the loop. But they would have to fulfill that high standard of coverage. That is acute care, preventive care, and long term care comprehensively. But the federal government would be the single payer. And so you and I, if you and I lived, in, let's say Lou Stokes and I and other Ohioans, could bid maybe, could choose from maybe five options, and all would have to have a high standard of coverage, mandated high standard, but maybe they would add coverage because they wanted to get it in the system, or maybe they would focus more on some services that perhaps we weren't able to cover with the high standard of coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Saunders. Yeah. Let me just make a few points regarding the employer mandated uh, efforts that are, that are coming forth in Congress now. Uh, frankly, I think that an employer mandate approach is simply throwing good money after bad money. I mean, it gets back to the basic point. Do you want to try to prop up the system or do you want to create a new system? I think the evidence is overwhelming. We need a new, new system. For example, 
in terms of employer mandated, what type of coverage are we talking about? You have 50 million Americans today, many of them who are workers, who do have some coverage. But you know what? When they go to the hospital, when they're seriously ill, they still end up having to pay thousands and thousands of dollars in bills. Second of all, what happens to our senior citizens who are paying 18 percent of their income uh, for health care needs despite, uh, despite Med Medicare? How are they impacted uh, by employer mandated? And most importantly, the employer mandate does not begin to touch the issue of cost containment. The bottom line is, as Congressman Russo indicated, do we finally end the absurdity and the shame of throwing $100 billion out, of the, out into the garbage can because we want to maintain 1,500 separate insurance companies, all of them are sending bills, they're driving doctors crazy, they're driving patients crazy. Do we continue that process? We finally say, let's end it. And I have to say that I think the employer mandate does not do it. I think, though, as, as Mary Rose Okar and, and, and Louis Stokes have talked about, we're talking about political ramifications. And it may well me, be that those of us who want a real serious national health care system are going to have to not just negotiate within this building. We're going to have to leave the Congress and go out to the people, to the tens and tens of millions of people. And when the people say, we're not going to vote for any member of Congress who does not support a single payer national health care plan, maybe at that point we'll have national health care. Well, the gentleman yield. Mr. I Chairman, I think it's important to point out that people think that just because you have health insurance coverage or Medicare that you don't pay anything out of your pocket. Can I, I, the latest numbers that we have from HICFA, and that's 1989 numbers, <clears throat> the non-elderly, this is a category that they have, everybody who's not elderly is non-elderly. They spent out of their pocket, they spent totally in that category of the non-elderly, $135 billion out of $589 billion. Out of that $135 billion, out-of-pocket cost to the non-elderly was $71 billion. Yeah, $71 billion. Now, if you take the elderly, then that year paid $84 billion in total cost. Out-of-pocket for the elderly was $54 billion. So what we're talking is a health care system that still makes people pay an enormous amount of money out of their pocket. And what are they paying that money for? They're paying it for the profits of the insurance companies and for the administrative costs of operating a system that most Americans think need to be, needs to be fixed. So if we want to get comprehensive reform, you can get it for less money, less money than we currently pay. You can cover every American, man, woman, and child, for every medical necessity, including long-term care, if we scrap the current system and go single payer. That's Mr. Chairman, GAO it's said. the best deal in town. You Mr. can't Horton. get a better deal for the amount Mr. of money Frank we spend. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think we've had some very valuable contributions from all of the uh, congressional witnesses, including the four that are, that are still here with us. Um, um, as a matter of fact, I think what we've done is put the spotlight of uh, public attention on this problem, and, and I think that needed to be done. And what's been said, uh, I think, has been very, very helpful in this dialogue. The one thing I'm really concerned about is what uh, Mr. Stokes was saying. It sounds to me like we just transferred it from the Pepper Commission to the House of Representatives. And uh, if we end up like the Pepper Commission did, uh, we may end up with nothing. And I, I do think that we've got to come up with something that, uh, in this Congress, I don't mean the next Congress, we've got to come up with something in this Congress. And I, I just feel that um, um, uh, the, the appropriate committees, we're not, a, we're not one of the committees that has jurisdiction over the legislation, but uh, at least we brought the, uh, the spotlight of attention on the problem, but I think we've got to move expeditiously on this because it, as I said earlier, and most of you have already said, it is the biggest problem that I think we face in this country today. People are not being taken care of, and, then, and there are people falling, as I said earlier, not through the cracks, but through large holes. They're not being covered at all. And, um, um, unless you're wealthy, um, you're, you're, you're in trouble. So, um, and, and, the, and the elderly are having some terrible problems out there, as you all know. So I think it's, a, it's incumbent on us to uh, bite the bullet and do what we have to do, even if, um, 
if we don't all agree on the specifics. But uh, I hope we're not just transferring it over from the uh, Pepper Commission to the, uh, to the House and, and then that we don't do anything about it. So um, I want to thank each of the witnesses for their contribution, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Dennis Haster. Well, I thank okay. the Chairman. Certainly Hang on for just one second. Our reporter. Steno reporter needs a break. You think you've got enough paper for the rest of the day? <laughs> for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> got Bob Wise down there, too. Gentleman from Illinois. Well, I thank the chairman and certainly uh, <coughs> the uh, fine testimony from uh, <coughs> the members of this uh, body. But uh, there's an old saying that uh, sometimes things cause me to wonder. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons that uh, we have the system we have today, and, you know, uh, we, it's not new, we've talked about this in this committee before, but. Uh, the expectations of people in this country of you know, the health care that they can receive are very high. And you start to go to a Canadian system when you have the various provinces say you can have this but you can't have that and all of a sudden you bring you know, the government into to making moral decisions on who gets health care and who doesn't get health care. Uh, how do you get around that? And uh, you know, I, the gentleman from Vermont talks about uh, state by state uh, bringing these health care systems in. You know, I look at the state of Illinois that the gentleman from uh, uh, Mr. Russo uh, comes from, as well as myself, a colleague from that fine state, and, uh, you know, the, the Medicaid portion is in shambles. And, uh, you know, the providers aren't getting paid, or there's slow pay, no pay, and, and uh, uh, <coughs> it's, it's just not real good. And I'm not sure that uh, that <coughs> is the answer. Well, the gentleman yield, I, mean, I think it's easy to answer that question. Once you go to a comprehensive benefit program where you cover everything, you solve the problem. You don't have to have VA hospitals anymore. You don't have to have Medicaid programs. You don't have to have Medicare programs. You will have one benefit that every American is entitled to. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor or the average American. They're not going to be priced out of it. They're not going to have to worry about getting coverage. And you can do it through a single-payer system. So once you have the ability to cover the cost and contain the cost with the things that we have, like global budgeting and expenditure targets, then, Dennis, you're not going to have the problem of not getting paid. Because under the system, they would be paid every month. And also, there's not going to be a thing called uncompensated care anymore, whether it's a doctor or a hospital having to take in poor people or indigent people and say, well, I'm not going to get paid. They're going to get paid. It's not as if the money's not there. The money's there. All we have to be able to do is collect it and, and distribute across a wider spectrum. And that's what you do under a universal single payer program. And it's not going to be like the Canadian system where each province, at least under the bill that I have, where each province gets to say what they cover. I just say, listen, I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want to make it complicated. Here it is. Everybody gets this benefit. And it doesn't matter who you are, you get it. And, and is I can't there anybody any determining what benefits people get or don't get? I mean, can anybody? Well, the only thing they can get is there any is upfront dollars that people have to? I'm reclaiming my time. And Pardon? let me ask a question. Let oh, me okay. reclaim my time did. and ask a question. Is there any upfront dollars that people have to pay? I mean, no copay, no deductibles. What? No copay, no deductibles. So there's no copay and no deductibles, and uh, anybody that gets a headache can go to the doctor anytime they want to. Absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with that. Could, could I address your, your point, Congressman? I got to run to another uh, hearing. Thank you. You, have, you are, are touching on an issue that is frequently um, uh, used, and that is the issue of uh, rationing that we sometimes hear about in terms of, of Canadian um, uh, health care. The fact is that we are. Rationing in this country is absolutely chronic. I mean, it's chronic. If you don't have, I have a nephew who's a young doctor. He tells me he's an emergency, in emergency medicine. And he tells me that everybody now, so many people now, are going to the emergency ward for what they should be going for other kinds of services because they're worried as Congressman Sanders said about their ability to pay. The other whole group of people who are, are rationed in this country are high risk people. We had testimony during the Pepper Commission of people who, even if they had 
We had a woman who said, I make $70,000 a year. I can't buy health insurance in this country because I have a chronic disease. Do now, we have, our, our rationing is so widespread. And the fact is, you take one of the greatest hospitals that I know of in the country, as Cleveland Clinic happens to be in Congressman Stokes' district. Let me tell you something. Their system is very, very interesting because, first of all, they have made a point of saying they will care for anybody who walks through the door, and that includes Medicare recipients, Medicaid. As you know, some hospitals, you know, if you don't have the coverage, you can't get in the door. Well, if I were to claim my time, okay. it is my time. Uh, yes, I, I know. I just, who I, pays? The government. Who pays for the, that hospital? I mean, we got Cook County Hospital in Chicago, and, you know, it, it's bankrupt. Let me tell you what, the, what my solution would be about paying for it, which I wanted to get into very, very quickly. We, we pay $700 billion right now. About $500 billion of that, uh, slightly less, are government programs. Government programs. Absolutely. They are not private. Private insurance companies are involved to a tune of about $209 billion. Well, one of the Let's things say that drive the cost of, of, of both government programs, but especially in the private pay, is uh, you know it tr cost containment. I mean, we're trying to contain the cost of medic uh, when we have to get a second opinion and, and you know to start to limit uh, you know the, the swinging door. If, this, if the door swings and swings and swings and swings, one way to contain it is to have a standard of coverage that includes a single payer approach, global approach and prevention. If you analyze it over a three-year period, you save money, you save lives, you save billions when you prevent the disease from spreading. Let me ask you one other question, because so on. one of the real Go costs ahead. that drives health care today is uh, the cost of adjudication, that, that doctors offer up a lot more uh, uh, tests than they have to because they're afraid of adjudication. Uh, we have uh, tort reform in this package, too. Well, you, you want to respond to that? No, well, can I just make one point? Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Johnson mentioned that Canadian doctors spend 16 times more on um, insurance uh, for their protection. That it's just the reverse than Americans. It's, we spend 16 times more, and that's in your GAO report. The Pepper Commission did mention, did recommend, as the Congressman Stokes will indicate. Uh, that there ought to have some, ref we ought to have some reform in that area, and there are specific uh, elements of reform relative to that that would both protect the consumers and protect the people, not only doctors, but licensed health practitioners uh, who, who are licensed. And I think all of us would agree that there ought to be reform Jim in that area. Has expired. Oh, I've, I've had some people help me use it, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I apologize. Uh, the gentleman from uh, West Virginia, Mr. Bob Wise. Thank you. I'd just uh, like to refer the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hastert, to the Democratic Study Group report, which was released two weeks ago, which I think deals with a lot of the questions he raised. It's quite interesting in his review study of the OECD nations, when you talk about the swinging door, I believe you're referring to patient use. Uh, it's interesting to note that Americans use, go to the doctor less than most of our uh, companion industrial nations, those in the OECD, and use the hospital less and have a lower per day stay than most of our trading nations. So if, there are a lot of myths, I think, that need to be punctured, and that uh, I would urge you to, to look at that. The other reference I know, uh, the other observation I would have is our, our Medicaid plan is bust in our state also. But perhaps one reason is because Medicaid doesn't reward <coughs> the preventive medicine and primary care. What it does reward is the trauma, the acute uh, uh, onset after when somebody's delayed too long. And so they, they get Medicaid for going into the hospital. They don't get Medicaid often for going to the doctor for the checkup over the period of years. It would have averted the coronary problem or whatever it is. I just want to thank our colleagues for being here and because I think what you had in the panel today, Mr. Chairman, is a good summary of the different positions that are being put forth that hopefully, as Mr. Horton said, the Congress is going to be choosing between one of them this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Chris Shays, gentleman thank from you. Connecticut. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to, to thank the panelists who are here and also those who were preceded them and, and say to you that, that, that I'm someone who would like to see universal health care. 
Um, I do want to make sure that when we do it, we do it right. And I know that's the concern of all of you. Um, what motivates that is obviously, as you point out, the, the uninsured, the partially insured, even owners of small businesses uh, are looking at higher health care costs than they could ever have imagined, and, and they're at right on the margin of being able to stay in, the, in business. And then you have even the managers of large corporations who are advocating because of the cost of their product in overseas competition just has too much health care cost in it. So I see everything moving in that direction, the moral grounds, the economic grounds. We're, we're, we're going there, and it seems to me the question is uh, not whether we'll reach it, but whether we'll do the right job. <coughs> I, um, I also start with the premise, though, that we take the present system, which is good for those who can afford it. I mean, it, I, I believe it is the best health care in the world for those who are fortunate. Um, and so it seems to me our challenge has got to be uh, how do we do it without compromising the quality and without bankrupting the, uh, the, the public treasury. This is where I get uneasy, and I, and I just share this with you. It, th there's almost an intimidation that takes place uh, when, when my colleague will ask a question and will talk about, uh, he said, what about no, co is, is there going to be copay? Is there going to be a, a deductible? And, and the response is, well, you know, no, and there's nothing wrong with it. Well, there is something right about asking the question. There's something important about investigating a little more in depth the whole issue of cost. Medicare and Medi uh, Medicaid, when we started it, we were told it would not cost as much as it costs today. And it seems to me the key question is how do we control cost and have a meaningful dialogue without trying to intimidate each other. And I guess I come down to the issue, uh, and I'd ask you the panelists this, how do we control health care costs? If one, we don't get a tort, uh, it's, it's disgraceful that a doctor who is 60 years old, who may want to retire and have a partial, <coughs> have a partial practice, still has to spend $50,000 for one patient or whether he has 2,000 patients uh, just to be able to do that. Now, how do we get at that issue so we can keep them in? How do we, how do we get a tort reform? And I guess the last question is, any service, I start with this premise, any service that is free is overutilized. I mean, I take that as a basic economic tenet, that if it's free, you just sometimes use the service instead of using something more economical. And so my question to the panelists is, how do we control the cost? And I'll make this last comment. Um, a single payer, I agree. And I come from a state that's heavily an insurance industry. Uh, I'm going to be crossing swords with them. I think you have to have a single payer. But can we have a single payer per state or in regions? It doesn't necessarily have to be through it. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me if I may, uh, respond to Mr. Shea's excellent questions. And you, may, you brought up a point that we had not discussed earlier, and you're absolutely right. Lee Iacocca, if I'm not mistaken, is now in favor of a national health care system after he discovered how much Chrysler was spending for health care as opposed to steel. So it has a lot to do with international competitiveness, and you're absolutely right. The question that Mr. Hastert asked is a very fair question. In the best of all possible worlds, we'd love to all have anything, everything, but it costs money. How do we pay for it? And essentially, what some of us at least are saying is that, yes, when you eliminate insurance premiums, when you eliminate out-of-pocket expense, there's going to have to be a shift, of course. And the shift is going to have to be, as is the Canadian system, on the tax base. There will be increased federal taxes. There will be increased state taxes. The good news, though, is if we move toward a single-payer system, which can save us between $67 billion or $100 billion, you already have an ample bonus to begin the process of insuring the uninsured with that savings. Second of all, and equally important, a single-payer system begins to give us a real mechanism to control costs. I was the mayor of a city for eight years. My fire department wanted 20 percent. Police department wanted 15 percent. They could justify it, just as the hospitals and doctors can do it today. But I had taxpayers who had to pay the bill. So we had to say to the police department and the fire department, inflation is 5 percent this year. Guess what? That's what you're getting. Make the best of it. That's what a single-payer mechanism can do. It says to the doctors, it says to the hospitals, <coughs> guess what? This is all that you're getting. In terms of malpractice, I think what Mary Rose Okar was saying is true. If I am not mistaken, and I don't believe I am, malpractice insurance in Canada is significantly less than it is in the United States. Significantly less. You talked about you know, the problems with Medicare and, and how explosive the cost has been over the years. You're quite right. 
But what we are not talking about is simply pouring more federal money into the program. I don't support that idea. We need strong cost containment. The most effective way is a single payer system. May I just, may I just say that, that we will save a, a significant sum of money having a single payer. I totally agree with you. But by having a free service, the service will be used more and more by people who weren't using it and by some who don't need to use the service. And it seems to me, if we're going to be honest with each other, we've got to find a way to get at that. Um, I, my plan, HRA, that you might want to take a look at, uh, does have a co-payment with it. It is not exclusively free. Uh, but here's how I achieve savings uh, in terms of uh, cost containment. Um, the federal government is the single payer, but the state government um, uh, approval of, of the, would, you would involve the state with respect to uh, their approval of the global hospital budgets, the state government negotiations for fair and adequate health care provider at reimbursement levels that were adequate state by state. You would streamline the claims process, which could save uh, and the Pepper Commission staff found it would save $24 billion if we streamline the claims process. You would have a state approval of capital and high-tech equipment expenditures of hospitals and physicians and other um, physicians. And you would not have the need for advertising costs. I mean, we looked at what the insurance companies have to pay out for varieties of schemes to compete. And they could compete simply by bidding on this high standard of coverage. Um, and finally, um, uh, and they wouldn't need to, to have full page ads to, to join you know, this service or pay lobby, give gifts to people or whatever it is that they involve in themselves in. And finally, preventive health care, if you analyze it in early detection, not on a yearly basis, as CBO does, but on a three to five year basis. You save billions of dollars, and if we invest more in research to find cures for diseases, when we found a cure for polio, we saved a lot of money. Uh, and and that's, that's what preventive care does. And so all of those avenues. But I think you are right about the point about intimidation and so on and so forth. I think that's why I've formed with the help of colleagues, a health caucus, bipartisan, so everybody could talk about this, irrespective of what committees you're on, because we're all interested in it, and, and, and to see if we could do something mutually. Right. To Gentleman's get, get time our has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I conclude with just a comment, Mr. Sure. Chairman? Thank you. I just would want to say that, that, that there's no question that Canada's tort costs are less, but there's no question that it, even Canada's tort costs are too high. And there's also no question that Canada is the second, I think, the second highest health co cost nation. So it is a model for us, but even they are struggling with costs that are getting out of hand. That's true. A and I uh, just make that point. Gentlewoman from Connecticut, Mr. Laurel. And then we'll move to our hospital panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will, uh, I will be brief. First of all, I do want to thank, thank my colleagues very much. I, I really. It's most exciting, really, to be uh, here uh, today in this meeting, as it was for me last week with the, uh, with the GAO report, which I happen to think is a tremendous breakthrough. Uh, and I said last week that it was a very dispassionate, uh, analytic view as to how we can get our hands on this very difficult and complex problem. And there's some things about cost containment and, and single payer. <laughs> Um, uh, efforts that uh, we, can, we can use as a model, and there's some things that we can't, but we ought to adapt a system that meets what our own particular uh, needs are. Um, I support a universal uh, and affordable health care system, and uh, what's most exciting about today is I think that what Mr. Sanders is talking about is what's happening in the country is being uh, told to 435 members of the House of Representatives, this, doesn't, this discussion doesn't come out of the blue. Uh, we're all back every weekend, and there isn't a meeting, there isn't a, a group that I sit down and I talk with who doesn't talk to me about uh, their uh, wanting to, to change the health care system. It's frustration, it's outrage, 
And bottom line, it's fear that people are going to be without health benefits in their families, their businesses, large and small, hospitals, insurance companies, doctors, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I want to get there. Um, I think that the debate here today, uh, I think, will be transmitted to the full House in terms of thinking about this debate. I just have one, one quick question, and I just want to say is that the, uh, I guess it's the Pediatric Association, says that maybe what we can do is to look at this in terms of children, uh, universal health care in terms of children, and um, uh, maybe just children or pregnant women and so forth. I would like to see it all done at once, from my view. That's where I come from. And in terms of the question of political will, can we deal with, could, could we start, in your view, with um, kids 18 years and under and look at universal health care? Would that be useful to do? Can we create political consensus in which to do it? Uh, or should we just bite the bullet and go for the whole ball of wax at one time? That's my I question. I can answer the, uh, the gentle, gentlewoman. Uh, that was the political question that the uh, Pepper Commission dealt with. Uh, we talked about uh, the astronomical costs of trying to phase in uh, this entire program at one time. So then we talked about a 10-year plan to actually phase in this entire thing. And then one thing that we really felt uh, was feasible in terms of the American political will would be a program where you open up the window with uh, providing in the first two years health insurance or universal access to all children and pregnant women in this country. If, if that's not politically palatable, then nothing is politically palatable. And so that was our recommendation and our plan to try to at least start with that and, uh, and then try to phase in other aspects of the plan over the next uh, five to seven years, actually. Um, so to answer your question, uh, I think that may be an approach that even the Congress has to, to deal with as it looks at what is politically possible at this time in terms of our whole um, uh, constraints, economic constraints, financial constraints on us at this time. I, uh, I'm for whatever we can do, but uh, I, I really gave some of my colleagues on the Commission a very hard time about phasing in, uh, phasing in um, uh, benefits based on an employer-based plan because you really leave, when you have an employer-based plan, you leave a lot of people out who are not working for that company. And you got, you know, like part-time people, what do you do about part-time people? What do you do about minimum wage people? Uh, so I, I guess, you know, my heart of hearts is that I want to see something done, and I guess, you know, whatever gains we make, I'm for, but I would really approach it not in a piecemeal way. I would do it comprehensively. Uh, I would tend to agree um, with Ms. O'Carr. Uh, the issue, clearly, of how we treat our children today with five million kids who are hungry, children sleeping out of the street, is a disgrace. But I think the issue is not simple universality. For example, the president can appropriate $50 billion more. We can solve the health care problem. The issue is how do we provide health care to all people without spending more money than we presently are? So it's not just providing money to the children or to the elderly. It's changing a system and understanding that we are wasting huge amounts of money now on paperwork, That's which should go to the care of all of our people. So I think what we have to do is move toward a single payer system, take on the insurance companies, and tell the American people we can provide health care for all of our people, including the children, without spending a penny more than we're spending now. Well, I, I think, Ms. DeLauro, you've put your finger on it. Uh, whether this is going to be uh, a yeah. gradual approach, uh, or are we going to bite the bullet? And I think that if you can bite the bullet and still have a phase-in that has been talked about, I don't think that contradicts the plan. But we, we, this discussion has taken us to a new level from the last time. Because I think we're putting uh, the employer mandates under a, a little more closer scrutiny. And we're looking at the single-payer plan, uh, a, a few warts. There will be transition costs. There'll be, uh, it won't be smooth, uh, none of these changes are smooth, but I keep hearing a number of people 
from this side and the witness table saying that now is the time that we can't go on. We're 650 billion going to 750. <coughs> It'll be hitting around a trillion in, uh, right after the next century. And, and uh, most people say now is the time. And I think that's what's coming out of this very important discussion among members. Uh, we thank you very much for staying the course. One of the things we're talking about is more money. But you know, the Congress has been asked, we've already put up billions of dollars to bail out, quote, a bunch of crooks in the SNL. And here we are with something like this. And it seems to me that there ought to be money for, for these types of programs because uh, there, there are a lot of people that aren't covered. And I think that uh, the Congress ought to get the, uh, the necessary will to do what has to be done, and the money ought not to be the problem, uh, especially uh, in, in, this, in this area. We're going to be asked for more money for the SNL, as I understand it. You're right. Thank you all very, very much. This has been a very stimulating discussion. And I uh, apologize to my first panel and ask them to come forward. The, uh, Director of Federal Relations of the American Hospital Association, the Executive Vice President of the National Association of Public Hospitals, yep. and uh, the uh, uh, DC representative of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, we're asking Mr. Richard Pollock, Ms. Christine Birch, and Mr. Vickery Stoughton President and Chief Executive Officer of the Toronto General Hospital Canada to come forward. Yep. How you doing? It's good. Shall I begin? You, Mr. Pollock, okay. we uh, appreciate your patience. Uh, you represent the American Hospital Association, and uh, you've uh, advocated uh, many of the uh, issues. Of pr uh, solutions to many of the issues that have been presented. We will put all of your testimony into the record as previously agreed, and we'd like you to summarize your remarks, and we'd like to begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify and be a part of this discussion. Uh, as requested, I'll cover three areas very, very briefly. First, the need for national health care reform. Second, the hospital perspective on this crisis and third, our reaction to the GAO report. The answer to the first point is really very easy. There's no question that there's a need for reform, and the chairman and the committee should be commended for requesting the GAO report, for holding this hearing, and for making this a priority matter. Uh, clearly, the current system is a jumble of different programs that have evolved by default, not by vision or design, and it needs to be fixed. And so far as the hospital perspective is concerned, uh, we want to see a nation in which every single American has dignified access to the health care system, and we want to see a system in which no citizen is at risk of becoming financially bankrupt by the cost of illness or injury. And AHA has also developed a proposal that accomplishes these objectives. It is a pluralistic model that builds on the strengths of the current system to provide universal access. It's fairly similar to the Pepper Commission, the details of which are included in our written statement. Uh, for 87 percent of the population, we have perhaps the best health care system in the world, and that shouldn't be overlooked as a starting point. We also recognize that the price of universal coverage is cost control, and we think that the cost control challenge comes down to two basic questions. The first is how do we really contain costs rather than shift them from one payer to another, or from avoiding risk to managing risk on the insurance side. And the second key question is how do we assure that hard choices about cost containment are made fairly and in the public eye rather than through de facto rationing by providers because there will be trade-offs under any of the reform scenarios that are being suggested. In regard to the GAO report, uh, we find it very difficult to compare Canada and the United States in terms of sheer size, from population to the number of local government units to the magnitude of our problems in the area of substance abuse, AIDS, and homelessness. Unlike Canada, we have many, many major urban centers, and our society has much greater cultural and ethnic diversity, just to mention a few of the differences. 
Nevertheless, we do agree with the bottom line conclusion of the GAO report which is that reform efforts in the United States should build on the unique strengths of our system, but that some of their experiences are worthy of considering. Of course, there are some attractive parts of the Canadian system. It does provide universal access. It relies on negotiations between providers and purchasers to control costs. And it does have lower administrative costs, which may be difficult to translate into this country. But as I mentioned before, we do take a different philosophical perspective one that relies on pluralism as opposed to the creation of a monolithic system. In our view, it is pluralism that breeds innovation, and pluralism enables the costs to be spread among individuals, business, and government, rather than the burden being taken by one entity. At the same time, we have very specific concerns with the Canadian motto as well. Uh, given our hospital experience under Medicare and Medicaid, uh, we have real problems with the adequacy of government rates and those rates being extended to all payers. Moreover, the GAO report itself highlights a series of very important shortcomings in the Canadian system that include limited access to state-of-the-art medical care and the presence of waiting lines, which I think we would find very difficult in the United States to accept. There are also problems in its inability to spur development of innovative, cost-efficient delivery systems such as HMOs and PPOs, uh, and also the report identified some shortcomings in global budgeting approaches that result in inappropriate financial incentives that lead to inefficient activities like the bed blocker phenomenon. I guess the key question for everyone is how to achieve savings in administrative costs, which is something that is very attractive to hospitals who find an increasing quantity of health care dollars devoted to claims processing. But as some have pointed out, there are very serious problems in applying the Canadian experience to our country. For example, cost sharing for those that can afford it is considered to be a very effective way in preventing unnecessary utilization. But it also requires substantial overhead to administer. Other utilization review techniques ranging from monitoring quality to releasing mortality data, to evaluating clinical outcomes, to providing information on individual providers, all of that requires a substantial administrative infrastructure. And quite frankly, the United States is way ahead of other countries in that regard, and I assume we don't want to toss out all that has been accomplished in that regard. Therefore, in our view, it's absolutely critical that we work to reduce administrative costs to preserve a pluralistic system and the use of uniform bills may be a good first step in that direction. There's also a long list of other cost control elements that many major stakeholders agree on. In closing, uh, it's important to consider that addressing rising health care costs means more than controlling provider payments through global budgeting, through all payers, or through ratcheting down or squeezing providers. Unless we address the root causes of increased costs, we're never going to get it under control. And that means also looking at unnecessary care. It means developing consensus on appropriate limits of treatment, what works and what doesn't work. It means looking at tort reform. And it also means addressing deep-seated social problems like malnutrition, AIDS, homelessness, substance abuse, and crime, all of which uh, impair health status and drive costs up. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that while Canada doesn't provide us with a package solution, it does provide us with a model whose parts may, a source, may be a source of ideas that can be adapted. And I would hope that where there is agreement uh, on many of the pluralistic approaches, we can move forward as rapidly as possible to help people in need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pollack. Uh, we're happy to know that uh, we still have some public hospitals left and that there's an association for them. And, uh, Christine Birch is here rec uh, representing them. She's a former member of the uh, Senate Subcommittee on Health and Scientific Research, and we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The National Association of Public Hospitals has, for the last decade, represented a significant proportion of America's metropolitan safety net hospitals. Our members include 100 hospitals. While this may seem like a small number, these 100 institutions comprise America's most important health and hospital system. Our hospitals truly serve as a national health insurance system by default in our nation's urban areas. We are pleased to have this opportunity to testify on the needs for health system reform generally and the Canadian system in particular. We agree with the GAO report that the system appears to function efficiently and effectively for Canada 
And while we believe that there are fairly dramatic differences between the size and homogeneity of our two nations' populations and health systems, we agree that there are a number of elements of the Canadian system that deserve our careful scrutiny. I would like to accomplish four things. First, I would like to describe our current safety net hospitals in this country. Second, I will outline our principles for achieving national health system reform and universal access. Third, I would like to comment on those elements of the Canadian system as they relate to hospitals that we believe may, re may be replicable in America and also to point out several concerns we have with that system. Fourth, I would like to make some observations about certain special populations that require particular attention in the American system as we prepare to enact health system reform. NAPH member hospitals are the primary source of health care for uninsured individuals. Nearly 36 percent of our hospital discharges and 30 percent of inpatient days went uncompensated in our facilities. Nearly 42 percent of outpatient visits to our hospitals were uninsured by any form of insurance. Just 17 percent of our hospital's net revenues are received, come from private insurers. Over 50 percent of our hospital revenues come from Medicaid and direct state and local subsidy. These problems have been exacerbated in recent years by new epidemics concentrated on the poor and the disenfranchised, including AIDS, drug abuse, neonatal problems, and inner city violence. The ability of safety net hospitals to cope with these epidemics and still serve their other patients is further affected by a critical manpower shortage. These problems are not limited to the inner city areas of cities like New York or Los Angeles. For example, 15 percent of all babies born at Kansas City's Truman Medical Center in 1989 had traces of cocaine in their blood. Let me briefly outline NAPH principles for national health system re reform. First, we are convinced that leadership to comprehensive health system reform must come from the federal government. That's not just the Congress. We need leadership from the White House. We support universal access to basic health services for all Americans. We need fundamental insurance reform. While private insurance could continue under a national health plan, federal regulation, and federal regulation of the insurance industry should preempt state regulation in certain areas, just as the Hawaii plan that we discussed earlier this morning. We must preserve and maintain a strong and well-financed institutional safety net for those persons who inevitably fall through the cracks of any health care system. A national minimum health benefit package must be developed to cover essential preventive services, primary care, hospital services, and catastrophic. We cannot overemphasize the need for preventive care. We support the federalization of the Medicaid program. On the Canadian system, among the features we like, as did everyone else, we like universal access, we like the minimum benefit package, we like the features of reduced administrative costs. We are not opposed to a single-payer system. However, we question whether the disruption caused by the implementation of such a system is necessary when similar results could be achieved through an all-payer system. I enjoyed the previous discussion because maybe I was wrong. Maybe there is more of a will in Congress to tackle the single-payer approach than I had thought before I came here this morning. Although we support the concept of global budgeting, we see problems. The Canadian global budgeting fails to accurately reflect hospitals' financial requirements, particularly in hospitals that provide high-intensity, high-cost services. In addition, there can be a slowness to respond to market signals and an inefficient use of hospital beds. However, many of our hospitals already have a global budget through their local government. Global budget can work if it is properly sensitive to the needs of the population being served. Given the sheer magnitude and diversity of the American population, it would be impossible to directly transfer a Canadian-style system to America. A Canadian-style system in the United States would require the infusion of additional resources to cover the health needs of special populations. Drug abuse is a serious and growing problem in this country. Any universal access system must address this need in a way more comprehensive than the Canadian system. In a survey of NAPH hospitals, it was determined that 29 percent of all emergency department visits were drug-related. One hospital, Harbor UCLA Medical Center, reported that 67 percent of all emergency department visits on one evening were drug or alcohol-related. In Canada, which has a smaller homeless population than does the United States, homeless persons are enfranchised through the country's welfare system. Homeless persons receive their health care as part of their overall welfare benefits. In this country, the homeless are often not integrated into the welfare system and thus may not receive Medicaid. 
If a Canadian system approach were implemented, the need for community outreach to find and cover these persons would have to be increased enormously. In the case of the homeless, one NAPH member, Bellevue Hospital Center in New York, estimated that 20 percent of all inpatients were homeless at discharge and that such patients required stays that were twice as long as other patients. In regard to AIDS, there are only 5,000 diagnosed cases of AIDS in the country of Canada. The AIDS epidemic in this country far exceeds the magnitude of the problem in Canada and the per capita cost of a Canadian-style system in the United States would multiply accordingly. Health care reform must also take into account the extraordinary need for trauma care in this country. Fifty-three percent of all admissions to our hospitals were through the emergency department. And in the meantime, we are seeing that nearly half of the 23 <coughs> trauma centers designated three years ago in Los Angeles County have now closed their trauma units, primarily because of costs. Over 50 percent of the emergency room and trauma care delivered in urban public hospitals nationally is for uninsured patients. At the end of my formal testimony, you will find a list of incremental approaches that we could take if we cannot achieve this reform this year. We think this is a very high priority. We commend you and your committee for taking on this effort. Thank you. I thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to now turn to a person who's been in Boston, administrator for the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, and also has been the uh, president and CEO of the Toronto General Hospital since 1981. Uh, you've also worked, uh, Mr. Vickery Stoughton, uh, with merging uh, Brigham and Harvard teaching hospitals into a single operating entity. Uh, and we're, we're happy to have you here today to see what uh, input you can give us in this very difficult uh, complex of, of uh, programs that are being offered. Mr. Chairman, it's a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate turn, the opportunity. Turn on your uh, instrument, please. Appreciate the opportunity to address your committee. As you've indicated, I'm a U.S. citizen who has worked in healthcare in the United States, born and raised in Illinois, have been in Canada since 1981. The Canadian healthcare system is represents the most popular social program by far in Canada. It is, in fact, strongly held by the Canadian public, and there is an expectation on the part of government by the public that the program will be maintained at the highest quality and highest level possible. Moving there as an American in 1981 and taking over what is the largest teaching hospital in Canada, which is also a high profile job, there was frankly a bit of concern that an American was going to screw up a good system. Whether I've done that or not, I can't tell you, but nevertheless in about three weeks I'll be returning to the United States to uh, take up a job within the U.S. healthcare system. And now there is concern, of course, that I'll be bringing the Canadian system down to that job. I felt that the GAO report was accurate and an excellent summary of the way the Canadian health care system works. And I think there are a number of lessons in that report that need to be looked at in the context of the way the components of the Canadian health care system interrelate with each other. The first thing that Canada did was to say everybody should have equal and universal access to health care. That was the primary objective of Canadian policy and Canadian law. Now to make that doable and possible, then a number of incentives were built into the system. Good or bad, those incentives have enabled Canada to continue to provide health insurance to everyone at a cost base that has risen at a much lower level than what has occurred in the United States. Recall that at the time the U.S. was introducing Medicare and Medicaid in the 60s, Canada was introducing across the country this universal insurance system. And at that time, the Canadian system paralleled the U.S. system. Multiple payers, fee-for-service payment, approximately the same percent of GMP in both countries spent on health care. Since that time, health care costs in Canada have risen at a much lower rate. Since that time, the Canadian public has continued to voice sound support of the Canadian health care system. What is it in the GAO report that represents the incentives and the interactions within the Canadian system that make it work? Well, one of them you've heard a lot about this morning, and that's single payer. 
But understand, it isn't only single payer that makes everything work. It's also global budgeting. 50% of every health care dollar is spent in institutional care in the Canadian system. There is an absolute control over the number of dollars that are spent on institutional care in the Canadian system because of global budgeting. Now you might say that that creates an incentives for institutions not to treat patients. You might say that that creates an incentives for institutions to admit a patient and just keep the patient in forever because it's less expensive to provide the hotel services as opposed to treatment services. But on the other hand, there is a physician group that is dependent upon fee-for-service income. That physician group admits patients to the hospital. That physician group receives fees from those admissions, be they surgical fees or medical fees. And that physician group, in a sense, creates a counterbalance to a hospital that might want to save costs by not moving patients through the system. In addition to that, there is the whole issue of technology control. Technology control is a major component of the way costs are controlled in Canada. Now, all of this gives problems and gives benefits. There is no question about that. The Canadian system is not perfect. The problems you've heard about, you'll hear about. They have to do with quality. I'm going to speak about quality. They have to do with waiting times. There is no question that the, Canadian, the, the Achilles heel of the Canadian system is waiting times. But let's address those two issues, quality. First of all, tertiary programs are rationalized into few centers. That in and of itself creates waiting times, yes. But what it also does is it ensures that the centers that are providing those services have a large amount of patients, have enormous experience, and when you look at outcome indicators, morbidity and mortality, you find the Canadian healthcare product, patient care outcomes, are as good as any place in the world. And in fact, you find no Canadian center, centers that have bad outcome indicators simply because of the way these high cost programs are rationalized into select centers. Y you cannot say the same thing about the U.S. healthcare system. My contention would be that on a system in entirety, Canada represents higher quality than the U.S because of the way it rationalizes. Now, on the other hand, rationalizing will give you waiting times. Waiting times, if they become too acute because of the high-profile nature of the system, get debated very publicly in the media, and eventually more resources are put into the system, and it becomes a trade-off. Canadians know that a real emergency will get immediate access and attention. And Canadians have chosen that they would rather face the anxiety for elective services of waiting for those services than face the continued anxiety of knowing a major illness might bring about personal bankruptcy or denial of treatment because of lack of ability to pay for that needed care. Admit, admittedly, there are trade-offs. But there is no question in my mind after 10 years that as a system, the Canadian health care system has served the public in Canada better than the U.S. health care system has served all Americans. So as you begin to look at what might be done here, there are lessons from Canada. I would be the last one to suggest that you can move the Canadian system to the United States. But there are real lessons. And perhaps the biggest lesson is to recognize that any change takes leadership, and any change takes a commitment to a primary ob objective. And the commitment and the primary objective has to be to universal health insurance and universal coverage. Then it's a matter of constructing the system in a way that the incentives will support the delivery of services to those that need them in the most cost-effective fashion. And there are messages in the GAO report about structures in the Canadian system that allows that to play out in a positive way. Canadians are not concerned about waiting times, but the Canadian approach was not sold to the Canadian public on the basis of we're going to give you waiting times. In 1970, when the system came in, there were no waiting times. Over a 20-year period, waiting times have become more a component of the system and more of a problem in the system. But I would suggest to you there are more than enough dollars being spent on the U.S. health care system that you do not have to 
experienced Canadian waiting times for at least 40 years, were you to introduce some of the approaches in the Canadian system? Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank all the witnesses. Uh, let me, I only have two questions. Uh, Ms. Birch, what happened to public hospitals and the idea of nonprofits in the American system? We're, we're down to a handful of hospitals. The public hospitals have all closed. Uh, there's where you go in the city when you're turned away from every place else. Uh, they're usually booked to capacity. Uh, the medical staff uh, is frequently overworked. And it seems to me that, that this is a uh, at-risk uh, system. And I'd like you to explain to us in some kind of historic uh, way how this came about and what, what has gone on. There's no easy answer to the question. One of the problems, as you know, is in the past 10 years, more and more the burden of the social safety net has fallen on the cities. Many, some cities, not as many as you might think, have not been able to keep their public hospitals open. Philadelphia General has closed a few others. More hospitals have downsized. Some have changed to a not-for-profit technical status. And the county government will still contract with the city government with them for services. The problem the hospitals are truly facing, though, is that the cities and local governments are hurting also. So for instance, if Congress does a Medicaid expansion, the hospital itself does not necessarily get a lot more money because, very coincidentally, you might see the county or local subsidy decrease by a dollar figure that's fairly close to the figure that had come in the other way. These hospitals are at a straining point. Um, I think if more of these hospitals go under, that might be an incentive for the health system reform, although many of the patients who come in our hospitals are disenfranchised. They come into us too late and they're too costly. If, in fact, we had a better system of preventive care, you wouldn't have the need to shore up our hospitals as much, and we'd be very supportive of that. Well, doesn't this have a tremendous impact on uh, African-American and minority citizens who frequently find themselves within a, a city municipal setting, and they end up uh, being the primary users of these hospitals, uh, bringing the, uh, the most uh, long-term outstanding illnesses, uh, usually with the least amount of insurance. So that all of these factors are now uh, are hitting us at the same time. I seem to notice a trend of uh, of more hospitals moving out of the city. That they're they're locating away from uh, unreimbursables and people who have no way of paying whatsoever. Is that still going on? That is still going on. There's several things you addressed. First of all, in our hospitals, these are majority patients. They're not minority patients in the bulk of our hospitals. We are, however, finding because of the failures of the education system, people no longer interested in health careers, which as you know in the inner city are good jobs. You can't keep a hospital open if you can't attract good technologists, you can't attract good nurses. There's a real problem that the cities need to face up to, which is both giving jobs to their people and serving their people in a health care capacity. And this is something we've been trying to get some attention to for a while. Well, that touches also on the training uh, of not only uh, uh, health personnel, but doctors themselves. There's a, uh, there's a great difference between uh, other systems and ours in which mostly the, uh, the costs of training a, a medical person are largely subsidized. Uh, we have people coming out with huge debts, then facing opening a practice, which is another huge debt, and, and th there's less enthusiasm on the part of people that want to go into health careers for doing that. And I think it's, a, it's something that has to be considered as we talk about this change. I think you have to look at it. I think what you have to look at very closely is what Medicaid is now paying physicians. With all deference to the medical profession, no doctor can open a private practice in Harlem and be reimbursed $11 a visit and be able to pay the overhead rent even on a storefront. And that's what's happening in a city like New York. 
Therefore, they come to the public hospital too late and too sick. Right. Mr. Stoughton, uh, I want to re-raise the discussion of whether we've come to a point in time where we have to consider a single payer and what experience or views you have about the uh, employer mandate system. It seems that uh, much of this debate is beginning to settle in those terms over uh, where we make uh, a little improvement with, with no, uh, no control over costs or we, we go to a single payer and then uh, put in global budgeting and, and some kind of fee scheduling so that we really get a fix on the costs. Well, I personally don't believe that uh, one can reform the system without uh, control over the dollars. And I don't believe that control over the dollars means uh, taxation. I, mean, I think it means capturing the dollars that are currently being spent in a different way. Uh, whether or not employees pay into uh, some kind of federally mandated system, I think is something for you people to decide about how to do it. But, but if, in fact, reform is going to start, it, it, is, it has to start, in my opinion, with control over the money. The providers will respond to the incentives in the system. Whether we're in Canada or in the United States, we all try to game the system within our ethics and within our values and within everything else. But we all respond to dollars. And depending on how the dollars are directed, that's the way we're going to respond. So if the dollars create incentives to overutilize or the dollars create incentives to compete, we're going to compete. And those are going to be objectives along with treatment. And um, what Canada has done is change some of the incentives uh, such that they support care. Now, again, I'm not saying Canada has been wise in every decision. I, uh, some of the decisions on um, allocation of technology have been anything but wise. Uh, but hopefully uh, another well-thought-out system wouldn't repeat the same mistakes that on occasion Canada makes. Canada has innovation. I made some comments about innovation uh, in the um, submission that I gave you. Don't for a second think that the Canadian system is without creativity and innovation. In fact, honorable members of this group and honorable members of the Senate have come to our hospital to receive care. If the uh, quality of our programs were so poor, I cannot imagine that uh, educated members of this government would come to Canada to receive that care. Um, well, do you, do you see us uh, getting uh, much further down the line with the employer mandates? Uh, because it, do you, have you had any experience with that or? Or well, do you, uh, since I have been out of pass on that, I, I, I think I'd rather pass on that one right All now. Right. I just haven't given it any thought. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Mr. Pollock would respond to it. <laughs> well, I, I think I think I understand where where the representative of of the uh, hospitals have to come from. Uh, 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 he can't be the first to come forward to advocate the global budgeting. Uh, that's, that's the whole, that's where the pressure point really is here, in addition to medical fees. We, we have these costs, but unless we put a cap on them, uh, it's never going to stop. Uh, we, we've been going up, 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 650 to 750 billion dollars. It'll hit a trillion somewhere as we turn the century. So uh, I, I can't, I can't ask, uh, the hospital representative to uh, tell me why he would like to try this out to, to, to cap these costs. Well, well, I'd, I'd be delighted to respond. <laughs> well, I'll ask you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's important to recognize that on, on the hospital side, already an average hospital over half or roughly around half of their revenues are in fact capped, rate set, set in concrete through the Medicare and Medicaid system. Uh, and we had worked back in 1983 to put into effect a whole new system that essentially established a, a cap on those amounts. So we have already been and continue to operate under that kind of system. So why do they keep going up? Well, they keep, well, first of all, on the hospital side of the equation, you know, when you look at the joint, the gross national product, the hospital portion of the gross national product has been relatively level since 1982 at somewhere around 4.3%. So a lot of the growth 
uh, from our perspective, is not going on in the hospital, and much of the growth that is going on under the government programs uh, is legitimate in the fact that there are more people being covered and that the intensity of the service in the hospital has increased substantially as we've moved other people out of the hospital into alternative settings. So the people that are in the hospital are a lot sicker than they used to be and they consume more resources. So government set rates is something we've been uh, operating with for a long time and the experience is one that causes us concern to move it to the whole private sector. Well, I think I would be misquoting you if I left this hearing saying that uh, you're used to global budgeting and you're in it now, and so if we imposed it, it wouldn't change too much. No, it's, we, we are not used to global budgeting. What we're used to under Medicare is set rates under the prospective payment system, and our experience in those set rates and uh, the hospital financial conditions as a result of those set rates is one that causes us grave concern in moving it to the private side of the equation as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Stott. Just make a comment on employer mandates. Employer mandates um, might help in providing um, coverage, but employer mandates in the absence of cost control are not going to solve the problem. In fact, small employers and large employers are just going to scream louder about the rising costs. In Canada, as an example, the component of the system that is most out of control from a cost point of view are those components that are associated with volume reimbursement. Drug costs, uh, physician visit costs. If there's no cap on the number of visits a year or number of times a patient can see a physician, then the costs go up at an unpredictable level. Canada tries to control that by, um, by mandating lower fees and does it somewhat effectively. But Canada is prepared to allow those costs to advance faster simply because 50 percent of every dollar is tightly controlled. In fact, more than 50 percent. And the reason I say more than 50 percent is because Canada does not allow technology to be put out in a community outside of a global budget um, requirement. A physician can't open a diagnostic center or a treatment center out in a community without getting an approved global budget. So the only part of the Canadian healthcare system that is, in a sense, out of control from a cost point of view is that which is directly related to non-global or volume-driven fees. And we're one to mandate coverage in the absence of some kind of cost control. Uh, you're not going to solve the problem. And, and we don't have any controls there. Hospitals compete uh, across the street from each other to bring in uh, high-tech equipment, that, that goes on uh, city after city. And uh, of course... But those uh, are the incentives in the system right now. Th that's what's there. And that's why it seems to me that, that we have to talk about uh, cost controls that work w with reference to any system that we bring in and consider. You know, I'm, I'm unencumbered by a constituency, but in, within six months, of course, I'll be saying something entirely different because uh, that's the nature of the system I'll work in. Well, we, we trust that your conscience and your experience will lead you to make the same good statements that you're making here today. Uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Frank Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pollack, if you had a single-payer government-run health insurance system, would you, uh, in the hospital system, uh, uh, realize um, um, lower administrative costs, in your opinion? Uh, n not I mean, this is one of the yeah. things the GAO report pointed right. out with regard to the uh, Canadian system, that uh, much of the administrative costs have been eliminated. And I think that's right, and Mr. Stoughton, that uh, basically that uh, is one of the incentives. Yeah, one of the things that we've done in this country, uh, unlike other countries, is that we have made great advances in knowing an awful lot about what we do in health care and what we do in our hospitals. And uh, a lot of that is a, a result of billing systems and systems that are already in place. And when you look at what we do to monitor quality and the structure that's set up along those lines, uh, the release of mortality data that the Healthcare uh, Financing Administration puts out on an annual basis to let people assess what they're doing and where they need to look closer. When you look at all the work that we're doing in terms of looking at evaluating clinical outcomes and the research that's being attempted to establish medical practice parameters, all of that stuff is, uh, requires a lot of an administrative structure. And if we are to retain 
a lot of the work that is being done in those areas, which I believe we would want to retain and which there's widespread support to retain, then I think it's going to be tough to realize the kind of savings uh, that result from the single payer concept. Mr. Loughton, how would you answer that question? Well, I, w I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, not, not that I disagree that the information is unimportant. I think it's very important. But um, a lot of that information exists within the Canadian system. The real question is, is there an incentive, incentive to use it? And frankly, it hasn't been used in the depth that it should be used, and that's starting to change. The reality is, though, that most of the provincial health care um, systems, in terms of administrative overhead, run at around, about a 3 to 3.5 percent rate of the total cost. And I made some comments in the, in the uh, written report I gave you, uh, comparative comments about uh, what would happen were the provincial system in Canada to run at the lower cost ranges that exist within um, insurance companies in the United States, which if they get down to 7 to 7.5 seven percent, uh, they think is quite low and quite reasonable. And yet in the provincial health care system in Ontario, that would have added $640 million a year to the health care budget uh, were they to go from 35 to about 7.5 percent. Likewise, in, in Canadian hospitals, um, in the early 1970s, and as it played out between 70 and 75, uh, two-thirds of the um, finance and accounting office and uh, information systems office disappeared. Uh, that money wasn't taken away from hospitals. That money was redirected toward patient care services. So there was a substantial savings, and you've heard testimony on that earlier today. Now the question becomes, can you minimize the overhead and retain the information? And I would hope that there's enough automation now in U.S. hospitals to allow that to occur. Uh, Canada has been slow to introduce automation, uh, and it's been a problem, but some of the hospitals, like the one I run, have as sophisticated an information system as any hospital here in the States. What about the, <coughs> excuse me, what about the, um, the billing system in Canada? Um, well, the only thing Canadian, that's one of the big problems right, I the think only thing we have Canadian in our hospitals, hospitals bill for is, I say the only thing Canadian hospitals bill for is a um, telephone charge, basically. Uh, if the patient wants it. Um, we might bill a private insurance company for some, some services that are not covered by, uh, by the health care system in Canada. Uh, it's, to our, it's to our benefit to do that, so we do a little bit of billing, but we're not, uh, we're not tracking charges the way U.S. hospitals are. In terms of uh, physician fees, it's very straightforward. The doctor uh, sends in a tape now uh, based on a fee schedule that's been approved um, by the uh, government and by the uh, local medical association and uh, gets automatically reimbursed um, by the single payer, which is the government in each province. Well, now, it's, one of the big problems we have in this country, of course, is the medical and the hospital uh, professions. Um, uh, as it relates to the present system, of course, it's, um, uh, uh, it's pretty much um, um, on its own I, I mean, each one of those areas, the doctors, although there are some um, fee schedules that we have to operate on it, but for, for a major portion of, uh, of their practice, uh, most uh, doctors uh, um, have the option of um, making the, the charges or billing, um, and the hospitals bill basically on, um, on what they uh, feel is justified or based on whatever their practice expenses are and that sort of thing. Uh, you were talking about the doctors in, uh, in New York City who have the very heavy expenses, uh, and they have to um, they have to make that up. And the malpractice, which is another problem here, what has the um, Canadian system done with regard to the medical profession? One, two, what has it done with regard to the hospital uh, system in Canada, vis-a-vis -vis what we have in this country? Well, in the 1970s, hospital budgets were were capped. So whatever your budget was in 1969, that became the base for the global budget in 1970 when the universal insurance system started. Nothing was taken away, and then from that point on, only inflation was added, or if in fact you had an approved program, you got additional resources added to your global base to uh, pay for the costs of running that uh, approved program. Those approved programs might be associated with new diagnostic technology capability or new treatment capabilities. You always had the uh, discretion to reallocate internal resources to, to accommodate new medical capability, and a lot of that has occurred within Canadian hospitals. 
Insofar as the physicians are concerned, the fee schedule is set and it covers the entire province irrespective of location. So a physician in a remote area is going to re receive exactly the same fee as a physician in a, in a major city. Well, Toronto now, the, the question I'm, I'm trying to ask is this, that we've had some experience with wage control and price control. I've had that uh, since I've been in the Congress and during the Nixon years, we put on wage and price controls. And as a result, um, it um, skewed the system. Uh, I can remember in Rochester, New York, uh, um, a friend of mine who had a, um, uh, some tomatoes, an eight-quart basket of tomatoes. He said it would cost me with the wage and price control, the price control in this case, would, um, a dollar, he had to get a dollar twenty-five. He said, but, but he had no tomatoes. Uh, we didn't have fertilizer. Um, wage and price control skews the system. What does the control system do with regard to uh, uh, the system in, in Canada? I mean, you've got, a, you've got a technology control you indicated, you've got a fee schedule control, you've got a control with regard to hospitals. What does this do with regard to the system? Well, and why is that different from wage and price control, if it is? First of all, the issue is really what does it do to the patient? Okay, what it does to the patient is has freedom of choice of provider. Patient can go to any provider they want whenever they want with uh, no questions being asked. Now, can the provider deliver the services uh, to the patient at, um, at that time? Well, the answer is, depending on the uh, type of problem, sometimes yes and sometimes no. And sometimes that provider is going to have to refer the patient outside of the local community to a service that is only located in another community. And then the system intervenes and provides transportation to, for that patient to that other community. So planes will be sent or bus tickets will be delivered or whatever the patient may choose. In fact, if I live in northern Ontario, I'll get $400 to go to Toronto to receive uh, care for coronary artery disease. Um, and that's the price of a plane ticket. And if I choose to take the bus, I pocket the difference. So essentially what it represents is the system has built in a way to serve the patient which is, from a patient's point of view, often not as convenient as it could be because they have to leave their local community. That's what the patient experiences. They get access, but it's not as convenient. Mr. Pollock, what would your comment be with regard to that situation with the hospital sy uh, system that we have now and if we had uh, something like uh, what we're talking about here, single payer? Well, I, I, again, you know, there are all sorts of trade-offs that are involved in this. You know, the trade-off for going with a single payer are some of the things that uh, Vic has mentioned. Uh, you know, we have concerns about, you know, our experience in government set rates. I think that that's what health care reform is about. There are a lot of different trade-offs. And if you, if you go with that, the Canadian type approach, I think we have to be prepared for the kinds of trade-offs uh, that we're talking about, many of which I, I really think a lot of people will have problems with. Well, that's encouraging. Um, one other question, um, uh, Mr. Stoughton, uh, with regard to technology control, um, th does, this, um, uh, does this have an impact as far, I mean, I understand some Canadians come to the United States to get their uh, medical treatment, and I assume that that's because they don't have the same technology. Is Canada no. um, Can uh, Canada worse off than we are with regard to technology? Canada has the same technology. They, they have it in much less volume. In other words, you don't find the same number of uh, MR machines. You don't find the same number of cardiac, cardiac, uh, coronary artery and, and uh, cardiac surgery centers in a major city that you would find in, in U.S. cities. You don't find the same number of dialysis centers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They just don't exist. You don't find the same number of lithotripters. Let me give you an example of uh, lithotripsy. Uh, you're familiar with this. This is a technology that um, crunches uh, kidney stones uh, non-invasively. Um, Ontario has a population base of about nine and a half million people. Uh, the government asked the committee to, to uh, make recommendations on the placement of lithotripters in the province of Ontario. The committee evaluated the uh, incidence of stone disease within populations of nine and a half million given age, sex, and demographic uh, considerations. Concluded that three lithotripters were needed for the entire province and then made a recommendation on where they should be placed in terms of different population centers. That's the approach of introducing new technology. That was a rational approach and uh, with a wise government that works well. 
Um, contrast that with uh, a market uh, competition base where every, every hospital in the city uh, acquires the technology for the sake of capturing the market. And you can begin to see the differences in healthcare costs. Who's to say which serves the public better? Uh, the technology is there. In the Canadian system, you have to wait. Um, but d choices are made by providers as to who ought to be placed where on the queue so that the, the more um, immediate cases get bumped up on the queue and, and the less immediate cases um, get moved back in the queue. The providers make those choices. The third party, the payer, has nothing to do with that choice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. DeLauro. I want to thank the members of the panel. I think this has been very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for your testimony. I just wanted to ask Mr. Pollack and Ms. Birch if we do not move to a, a single-payer system. I mean, the administrative costs, I think, would so agree that we're talking about 20, almost a quarter of the cost of health care in this country are attributed to administrative costs. If we don't move in the direction of a single-payer system or we don't deal with global budgeting in some way, uh, how do we how do we really take on the cost control aspects of the system? I view that um, uh, the access as a very serious problem, but I have to be honest with you, I view the cost um, that people are experiencing and the cost of the system uh, as being the, uh, uh, the most significant problem that we have to try to cope with. Well, I, th I think one of the, if I may, one of the interesting things about this debate thus far is that there seems to be an awful lot of agreement among a lot of people on the cost control side, short of single payer or global budgeting, where we can begin to move. And that involves the small group health insurance market reforms. It involves providing incentives for managed care. It involves uh, reducing unnecessary care through the practice parameter concepts. It involves malpractice reform. It involves talking about the development of guidelines for appropriate use of technology and specialized services. It involves looking at antitrust laws that impede collaboration among providers. So there are already a series of, uh, a list of things that um, would, in fact, reduce costs that we ought to begin to move on and move on quickly, many of which I believe are part of the Pepper Commission report. Mr. Pollack, Ms. DeLauro, might I beg your indulgence? Uh, Mr. Stoughton has 10 minutes left, and what I would like to do is ask if any of you three wanted to ask any questions of him, and then we'll come back to you, Ms. DeLauro, for, for our other two witnesses. Did you want to ask uh, Mr. Stoughton any questions? I had the technology question, but that was asked. I, I just uh, do hope that uh, we will see you in six months and <laughs> that your views will be as, as strong as they, uh, as they are now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shays and uh, Mr. Saunders for questions to Mr. Stoughton, please. Thank you. You can go first. You first, Alphonse. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I would just um, really, uh, it's, it's almost maybe a caution, but I just feel in some ways we're a little too cavalier, Mr. Town, and I'd love your response to the very distinct differences between Canada and the United States and the challenges that we face. I mean, I just come back to tort reform. They do not have the same legal system in Canada that we have here. We do not have the same number of lawyers here that we have in Canada. Uh, and I just, uh, I would love your general response to that. I mean, we have a tremendous number of poor that are crossing into our borders that Canada is not faced with. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I, I, and then by making one last comment, I mean, our urban areas are in decay. Uh, I, maybe Canada's faced with that same challenge. But um, if you would respond. There's much more social equity in Canada than the United States. Social what? Equity. Yeah. Social justice. Um, Canadians tend to be more conservative. Canadians tend to um, trust and rely on government uh, in a much different way than um, has been done in the United States. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not about to tell you that there aren't differences. But I can tell you that if you, if you go back and look at the media literature in the 1960s and 70s as Canada was introducing its universal health care system, the hue and cry was no different than the hue and cry that has been in this country for years. I mean, what made the difference in Canada at that point in time was leadership. There is also no question that Canadians are critical. They're critical of government, they're critical of taxes, 
They're critical of the U.S. They're concerned about the impact of the big United States on Canadian culture, on Canadian business and Canadian industry. But there is also no question that industry works very close with government in Canada and that the public at large tends to lay back and expect government to resolve social issues. That's not to say people aren't creative, that's not to say they don't take initiative, but there is a difference. In a sense, Canada values the collective good over the rights and the good of the individual. Okay. And in the United States, the rights and good of the individual is paramount. Now I would suggest to you that if the U.S. was to introduce universal health insurance, that it would be as well received by the American public as it has been by the Canadian public. Well, I, agree, I agree with that. I guess my, my one concern is that uh, we're going to find it is going to be far more costly than we are willing to acknowledge among ourselves. And let me just say to you that, that I, I, I have total agreement that if we could go to a single payer that we would save, provided we really did it, provided and on the floor of the House we're not going to see amendments that say all the people that are displaced will, will find jobs for them. Because we're talking about tens of thousands of people, who, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who would be out of work with a single payer system. Otherwise we're not going to have the savings that everybody claims. So it's going to be an interesting little process that we're going through, but, but I appreciate your testimony, Mr. Saunders. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, is a pretty simple one. It's addressed to Mr. Stoughton, and I've enjoyed your remarks very much and agree with virtually everything that you've said. Uh, you mentioned, and, and we have certainly seen on television and read in the newspapers, that there are problems with the Canadian system. You mentioned, for example, that waiting periods are a problem. Others will argue uh, that there is not enough technology available and so forth and so on. Uh, what we don't hear, it seems to me terribly often, is the fact that we as a nation, the United States, is spending 40% more per capita than the Canadians are spending. So you're not really comparing apples and apples. You're comparing one system, which is spending a lot more money, the American system, than the Canadian system. Uh, we spend the $2,354 per capita. Canada spends $1,683. Uh, let me, my question is a very simple question. If we chose to continue level f spending as much money as we're presently spending, which is a lot more money than anybody else in the world and a lot more money than Canada. Is there any reason to believe that we could not make a significant dent or eliminate some of the, the, the problems that exist within the Canadian system simply by spending more money? Yeah, you're asking me whether I think the United States could, could uh, take some of the components of the Canadian system and be wiser in their adaptation to solving the universal problem, and I would think the answer is yes, because there is more money in the system to do that. That's my, precisely my point. If you had, if you significantly increased funding for the Canadian system up to the level that we are doing it now, well, you the would obviously solve many of the problems that currently exist. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Stoughton, we appreciate your time and your testimony and experience. We turn back to Ms. DeLauro. Uh, Mr. Pollock, I think I read, I, I just got the testimony uh, today. I, I thought I saw in, in your remarks that a comment about uh, suggesting looking at um, negotiations between purchasers and providers um, as a means of controlling the physician and hospital costs. Can you just talk a few minutes or a couple minutes about how that might work in your view? Yeah, uh, under our plan, what, what we're basically suggesting as a means to, uh, to achieve universal access, and we go with the employer-mandated approach, is that essentially for the public component, for those that aren't connected to the workforce, there should be a new public program uh, that replaces Medicare and Medicaid, and that the Congress ought to decide how much money ought to be spent on that public program, and then a target ought to be developed around which a basic benefit package is constructed, and then the actual rates that are developed would be a product of negotiations between both providers and uh, the purchases of health care that are administering the program. So there would be the opportunity there to, to negotiate out those rates. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't have any more questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shays. Okay. Mr. Saunders. Mr. Saunders. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you so much. You. Uh, you. This has been a very helpful panel. Finally, we come to our physicians' perspectives. 
Dr. James Todd, Dr. Whitney Addington, Dr. Quentin Young, and Dr. Charles Johnson. Dr. Todd, of course, is uh, Executive Vice President of the American Medical Association. Uh, he's been in a number of discussions recently, as yesterday evening, I understand. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. Whitney Addington is uh, with the American College of Physicians and President of the Board of Health of Chicago and ex-governor of the American College of Physicians. And uh, Dr. Quentin Young is President of the Physicians for a National Health Program, uh, is also a clinical professor of preventive medicine, Department of Medicine at University of Illinois. Uh, and Dr. Charles Johnson is President of the National Medical Association uh, practicing in internal medicine and endocrinology in uh, Durham, North Carolina, advisor to the Medical Center for National Health Policy. Gentlemen, thank you for your, your written statements, all of which will be reproduced in their entirety. We'd ask you to uh, summarize your remarks, and we'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Todd. Welcome to this hearing, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, my name is Jim Todd, and I represent the American Medical Association, an association that is committed to working with this committee, working with the Congress, working with many others to reform the health care system in a way that benefits patients. Our health care system at its best offers unrivaled quality, choice, and technology. It already provides insurance to 87 percent of all Americans. But at its worst, it is costly and provides uneven access. And the American Medical Association's proposal for reform, Health Access America, would retain the best and address the worst by building on the existing pu private-public partnership that is the foundation of our current health care system. Health Access America would expand access to the over 20 million working uninsured by requiring employment-based insurance. This requirement would be phased in over time and significant incentives would be provided to assist small and new businesses. Health Access America would also reform Medicaid to ensure that everyone below the federal poverty level receives uniform basic coverage. Now, as been said many times this morning, any reform proposal would be incomplete if it did not address the cost of the system. Our health care system is costly and it continues to demand more and more of our resources. But this cost is driven by several factors, including new and expensive technology, aggregate population growth, more health-conscious consumers who utilize more services and technology, inflation, and of course the health consequences associated with increasing societal problems such as AIDS, drug abuse, and violence. Health Access America addresses the cost dimension of health care reform by responding to those factors through the following measures. Development of practice parameters, technology assessment and outcomes research, preemption of state mandates to allow employers to offer an essential benefits package such as the one that the AMA has developed, medical liability reform, amendment of federal antitrust laws to allow the profession to review excessive fees, health promotion and disease prevention, encouraging appropriate utilization of health resources through tax incentives and through cost sharing, and supporting state demonstrations of alternative health delivery structures. In brief, Mr. Chairman, that is the Health Access America proposal. It was designed to improve access, control cost, and ensure the continued quality and sophistication of the U.S. health care system. In choosing this approach, we took lessons from other countries' experiences, such as the Canadian experience that the GAO recently studied. And I'll now turn to that study and provide with you the AMA's preliminary reactions. The Canadian system has many good attributes. For 20 years, it has provided all Canadians with access to primary health care. When measured as a portion of GNP, it appears to consume less resources than the U.S. system. The majority of Canadians report fierce pride in their system. And we salute these apparent successes, but do not believe that importing the Canadian system would be workable or optimal for the very different American culture. Although the single-payer, budget-driven approach is credited with controlling expenditure growth somewhat better than in the U.S. system, there are many resulting costs imposed upon providers and patients, such as limited research and development, limited availability of technology, which can lead to slower and less accurate treatment, deterioration of the health system infrastructure as a result of limited capital investment, 
reduced incentives for providers to seek efficiencies in health delivery. And these factors result in another type of access problem, one in which patients must wait for tests, treatments, and hospital beds. And we find this type of access problem no less deserving, uh, disturbing than our own. In addition, when measured on a per capita basis, it is not clear that the Canadian system has been any more effective at restraining cost. The unique characteristics of the American medicine and society indicate that the savings enjoyed by Canada would not necessarily be attained if the U.S. adopted a Canadian-style system. We have many costs that are unique to the United States, such as the cost associated with our tort system, the high rate of physician specialties, societal and health problems such as AIDS, violence, and border health, our investment in research and development, the cost of our burgeoning medical review industry, the cost of our sophisticated health data collection systems, and the cost of improving the delivery of health care. Converting to a single-payer system would not likely reduce these costs. In fact, our expenditures in such areas as data collection can actually reduce costs by identifying inappropriate expenditures. As the GAO study notes, Canada's underdeveloped information systems provide few incentives for hospitals to track per patient or per diem cost. On balance, we prefer seeking administrative savings through insurance market reform and claims administration reform and leaving intact the competitive system of health delivery. Monopolies tend to become inefficient over time, in great part because there is no need to compete. In fact, our experience with a single-payer type of program, the U.S. Medicare program, has been that as the program is driven more by its budget, it imposes more and more administrative burdens on providers. Rather than establish another government bureaucracy, we support seeking efficiencies through the reform of our competitive market. Lessons from the Canadian system are instructive for us as we debate and exchange ideas on the reform of the U.S. health care system. The Canadian system has many strong points, yet we do not believe that it can serve as a model for the United States. On behalf of the American Medical Association, Mr. Chairman, I commend you and your committee for your leadership in studying this aspect of health care reform. The GAO study is a significant contribution, and we look forward to further dialogue as we try to reform the system. At the appropriate time, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, I'm grateful for you joining in the debate early on. Uh, this is the beginning of an examination, not just of the Canadian system, but ultimately of our own, and we appreciate your comments. Dr. Addington, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the American College of Physicians is pleased to have this opportunity to present our views on the need for comprehensive health care reform. With more than 70,000 members practicing internal medicine and its subspecialties, the college is the nation's largest medical specialty society. I am Dr. Whitney Addington, a member of the EACP Clinical Practice Subcommittee and President of the Chicago Board of Health. My brief comments today will focus on the need for comprehensive reform to assure universal access to care, especially primary and preventive care, and will comment on the report of the General Accounting Office on the Canadian system. More than a year ago, the College published an editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine that called universal access to health care a medical and moral imperative. Mr. Chairman, I request that a copy of that editorial be included in the record of this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. We can delay no further the inclusion of all Americans into our health care system. We urge this committee and the Congress to adopt that goal. In a position paper accompanying that editorial, the college examined our health system and con concluded that it has become basically dysfunctional. It is certainly not serving the uninsured, but neither is it serving insured patients, physicians, employers, government, society as a whole. We must work for comprehensive and coordinated reforms that address not only access to care, but cost, quality, administrative burdens, and waste, liability, as well as other issues. Like others, our initial motivation for developing our policy was the 32 million or more Americans who have no public or private health coverage. We were also struck by the Census Bureau finding that more than 60 million people have inadequate coverage or gaps in their coverage. 
That means that one in four Americans may be exposed to the risk of catastrophic illness with little or no coverage. We would also argue with those who claim that people without insurance coverage manage to get through public hospitals, community health centers, or other means. Researchers at Georgetown University recently put that myth to rest. In a study that found that uninsured are up to three times as likely to die in the hospital and are provided significantly lower rates of expensive procedures such as hip replacements. As president of the Chicago Board of Health, I see that Chicagoans pay a high price for their lack of access to primary preventive health services. In the past two years, there has been a shocking and totally unacceptable rise in preventable infectious diseases. In 1989 and 1990, Chicago, as, mo as well as most urban centers, was struck by an epidemic of 2,857 documented measles cases, which led to 992 hospitalizations and nine deaths, nine actual deaths in children from measles. A few years ago, discussions were held at the NIH and at the World Health Organization on how measles would soon follow smallpox and be eliminated from the world. Active tuberculosis cases increased in Chicago from 1,200 in 1989 to 1,450 in 1989, and tuberculosis deaths increased from 44 to more than 80. Syphilis cases reported, reports increased 117% in 1990 to 5,500, while congenital syphilis rose 768% from 25 to 217 babies born with syphilis. We know what to do, vaccinate children to prevent measles and prophylactically treat contacts to prevent tuberculosis and syphilis. It costs so little, it saves so much, we need to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Quinton. Not quite through. Oh, you're not? Could you, could you uh, come to a conclusion? Certainly. We're, we're racing against a, a vote probably on the floor shortly. I appreciate that. Thank I just wanted much. to add briefly that the college in its full report has discussed the, what we think are uh, great strengths to the na Canadian health system and some potential, uh, potential problems and uh, have gone into that in great detail in our full report. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we have your report. It will be included in the record. Uh, that seemed like a great line to end on, and I, I thought you were finished, Dr. Eddington. Thank you. We welcome Dr. Quentin Young, also Chicago, uh, old friend. I hope you don't find a spot in my remarks. To, to end. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Representative Horton and the other distinguished members of the House of Representatives. I really can't exaggerate how much I feel this is an important hearing and will have great impact on our national health. I'm very pleased to appear before you today on behalf of the Physicians for a National Health Program. Our group, which was formed barely five years ago, already has over 4,000 doctors who seek basic reform of the health system of the United States. With the vast majority of our colleagues, we know that we work in a system which is fundamentally flawed and is overall failing to serve the American people. I can't help noting here that I'm coming before you as a practicing physician who every day sees patients in my office and in the hospital and I'm able to report from that long experience that, that this is the, the portion of America's doctors and of course the patients we serve. Let me at the outset laud the Government Accounting Office study Canadian Health Insurance Lessons for the United States, and of course, laud the chair and this committee for commissioning it. This is a historic document. It is at once a declaration of independence for the American people and the Emancipation Proclamation for their doctors. And I might add that when Congress enacts its principles into law, it will be the Constitution that will give us all the health services we need, with skill and dignity and without the specter of impoverishment and denial that haunts our present arrangements. The American medical profession universally has recognized the need for reform of health care finances. Too many people are left out. Too much of our professional ethics is compromised by patient dumping, wallet biopsy before deciding to render care to non-emergency patients, and health status statistics demonstrating the failings of our current system. 
Whitney Eddington's remarks document that, and I'm afraid that's not the whole story in this country. The American Academy, the American College of Physicians, the National Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics have long called for universal access. They are lately joined by the American Medical Association. These organizational expressions reflect the polls which uniformly show that the American physician is not happy in his practice or her practice and recognizes the need for basic change. PNHP has studied the Canadian system also. Our findings are very much in accord with those of the Government Accounting Office report. Let me stress that we in PNHP believe the U.S. can learn from Canada's magnificent 20-year experience in national health insurance. We urge critical evaluation and not mimicry of that country's achievement. Because our resources are so much greater than Canada's, as others have noted, we can already, we can readily avoid the relatively minor problems that system has encountered and have every expectation to achieve the universal and comprehensive mm. coverage that, that Canadians enjoy without financial burdens. The physicians of this country also can expect an end to the oppressive burden of bureaucratic obstruction as 1,500 insurance companies confound our efforts to serve our patients. Mr. Chairman, I want to note for the record that the object of insurance companies in America today is to limit services, and they have magnificent and numerous ways of achieving it. First, let us look at our resources, our national health resources. At this very moment, as the GAO report verifies, there are enough dollars spent for health care to meet the needs of every inhabitant of our land. The $67 billion squandered on private insurance administrative costs and profits could bring the 35 million of our population without coverage into the system. It could transform Medicaid from the abomination that it is into a full status partner in a system like Canada's that has only one class of patient. It could end all the co-payments, deductibles, and exclusion of care that curse our present health care transactions. Here I would echo the GAO report in acknowledging a possible place for small co-payments in the new system for participants earning, for example, above twice the poverty level. My own preference here would be to emulate the Canadians and outlaw such cash transactions <clears throat> between patients and providers. I, for one, do not think the American people will run away with that opportunity to get decent health care. It's no fun to get health care. It's fun and pleasurable to get your, your health needs provided for. In addition to allocating now 40 percent more per capita than Canada spends, we have many more resources in place that will that make some problems that have emerged in Canada easily obviated. Take, for example, the delays reported for certain high-tech procedures or highly sophisticated surgery. In general, the U.S. has a plenitude of these uh, devices and an excess of specialized surgical teams. A recent study noted that our 11,000 mammography centers are not only far more than we need, four times as much, the author said, even as we extend coverage uh, of, uh, to shamelessly, shamefully excluded hitherto to Medicare eligible women, but counterintuitively, this excess caused artificially high charges as the many underutilized mammography devices caused their owners to jack up unit prices. I might note that this dramatic report illustrates yet another example of the failure of the marketplace competition to operate in health care. Similarly, a tragic lack of planning in the production of physicians, coupled with irresistibly high financial rewards to specialized proceduralists, surgeons, endoscopists, radiologists, for example, has led to an undesirable excess of specialists and a serious shortage of primary care physicians, again in contrast to Canada. While the correction of this imbalance must go forward, it means that we have more than enough specialists in heart surgery and orthopedics to meet all the needs of patients under the National Health Insurance Plan. To repeat, we have the resources that are in short supply in Canada. We will not encounter, as uh, 
Mr. Stoughton said, for 40 years, the problems that Canada has. One other valuable lesson from Canada relates directly to resource allocation. The queues that form have allowed direct attention to patient needs. Thus, in Toronto, when the wait list for elective coronary artery bypass graft was as long as six months, the referring doctors were made aware of fully qualified cardiac surgeons who could schedule patients in a few weeks. Not only did this, this shorten the interval, but new referral patterns developed, utilizing the available talent better. In Canada, the problem can turn into the solution. Imagine how our country would be able to extend service to millions outside the system now with maximum utilization of our vast resources of professional skills, physical plant, and equipment. I want to say a word about washing, uh, pardon me, rationing, Mr. Chairman. At Cook County Hospital, which is the only resource for hundreds of thousands of people, a new patient appearing in the emergency room who needs an appointment for outpatient care, I'm not talking about admissions to the hospital, will be given an appointment nine months from today. If people go to Dr. Addington's excellent public clinics in this, that the city runs, new patient in need of care, he or she will be given an appointment three or four months from today. How can we talk about rationing when that is the portion of literally millions of Americans who are on the dark side of our economic ladder? Dumping that I alluded to is another way of, of, of rationing that is, it oftentimes leads to fatal outcome and never helps the patient. Uh, I have in my prepared remarks nine outstanding arguments against employer-mandated employer services which I won't burden you with now, but they, they devastate this silly failed system for, for trying to face the cost and access question. Again, let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. We turn now to Dr. Johnson. Welcome to our, our hearing. You're the last witness, but certainly not the least, because you represent more underserved uh, than anybody else as president of the National Medical Association. I think you see this from a very unique perspective, and we welcome your presence on the panel. Thank you, Chairman Cunyas, and for those kind remarks as well in opening. And we're very pleased that you were considerate enough to invite us to appear before this distinguished committee. And certainly we are on the front line of all of those uh, inequities that you've heard so eloquently presented here this morning. Uh, I would like to thank you personally on behalf of the National Medical Association for this opportunity to address our perspective on the health care crisis, including cost and access problems, and our reaction to the findings of the report issued by the General Accounting Office on Canadian Health Insurance Lessons for the United States. I would like to divert you, if I might. You saw me jump up and shake Vic Stanton's hand. He is the new Chief Executive Officer at Duke University Medical Center. While I'm on the faculty and, and he doesn't take his position until July 1st, I was trying to make myself easily accessible and friendly usable before he got there ahead of all those other groups. So I appreciate the opportunity to meet him while he was here as well. Good politics. <laughs> as President of the NMA, I'm here on behalf of an organization that was founded in 1895, which represents over 16,000 physicians from throughout the United States, the Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico, who are among the primary providers to the medically underserved and low-income minority populations. The NMA primary care providers are painfully aware of the disparity between the health status of the uninsured and underinsured minority populations in comparison to the general populations of this nation. We view firsthand disproportionately higher rates of infant mortality, cancer, heart disease, AIDS, and any other disease you can name among the indigent segment of the minority community. The 1985 report of the Secretary's Task Force, better known as the Heckler Report on Black and Minority Health, in 1985, pointed out and documented that there were 60,000 excess deaths among blacks and minorities that could have been prevented if they had received health care as given to most non-whites, non-minorities, I'm sorry. I would like to say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we would be a little remiss if we didn't point out over that interval of time that figure has risen to an excess of 360,000 deaths, no longer 60,000 of those who are paying attention. 
which clearly is an unconscionable stain upon this nation's breast, but something that we certainly can remedy. The medically underserved and low-income minority members of our society do not receive adequate health care primarily because they are uninsured and underinsured. What the NMA has known and has stated for many years was pointed out in a recent editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association, thanks to Dr. Todd, one of my friends and colleagues, that the inequity in access to health care is a result, quote, of long-standing systematic institutionalized racial discrimination, end of quote. The most interesting comparison made by the editorial was the fact that the United States and South Africa are the only two developed countries that do not have a national health policy and are also the only two industrialized nations that have substantial numbers of underserved people who are different ethnically from the controlling group. The most significant aspect of the Canadian system is that it provides universal access to all citizens. NMA has and continues to be a strong proponent of universal access to adequate health care for all Americans, but especially black Americans. In Canada, universal access is provided to all citizens regardless of employment or economic status. In this country, we find that both employment and economic status determines the availability and adequacy of insurance, health insurance in this country, particularly among the working segment, is provided primarily by the employer because African Americans and Hispanics have higher levels of unemployment and low level paying jobs, they tend to have less employment related health insurance and are therefore less likely to receive medical care. Universal access, which assures that all residents have health insurance regardless of employment or economic status, is an aspect of the Canadian model that we embrace and encourage the legislators of this country to implement. We also recognize the findings by the GAO that the Canadian model eliminates administrative waste and generates enough savings to cover the 33 million Americans who are currently uninsured. Our present system simply generates burdensome paperwork, requires many man hours. There are approximately 1,500 different health insurance programs in this country, and each has its own set of rules and regulations, claims processing, mechanisms, and market departments. Critics of the Canadian Mall also propose that we would lose our lead in the area of medical technology if the Canadian Malls were adopted. Canada spends much less of its GNP on medical research and development than does the United States. It is a legitimate concern that the United States should continue to advance in the field of medical technology. We applaud Canada in its efforts to provide universal access to all of its citizens. However, we recognize that the difference between the two societies must be considered. Although NMA does not fully endorse the Canadian model, we support the principle of universal access to adequate health care for all Americans. We believe that any restructuring of the health care system in this country should be based on that principle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all very much. This is, has been very important. Uh, but Dr. Todd, I, I'm, I'm happy the AMA is moving along in a fine way, but you know, I remember when AMA opposed Medicare uh, you were not uh, in the office then, uh, and I noticed you you made some remarks about it now as uh, being an example of why you would have reservations about the single payer. May I point out to you that the Medicare costs go up because the hospital and medical fees go up, not the administrative costs. The GAO has shown us that uh, Canadian administrative costs 1.2 percent, uh, Medicare 2 percent, but 11 percent for private American costs on the, in the private sector. So it seems to me that we may be rushing a little bit prematurely to a judgment that don't let the government do it uh, when in Canada, the administrative costs are lower. 
Uh, in the United States, under Medicare, these administrative costs are lower. That the, the, the expenses are being fueled in other areas. And so it, it seems to me that, that that in itself would not be a reason uh, for, for moving away from uh, an, an experiment of this magnitude. Uh, in, in addition, we're talking about a plan, Health Access America, in which uh, deductibles and co-payments would continue on. And there's the back door to the costs that keep going up. And so it seems to me that this is not going to solve this, the problem that we have. Uh, it's, it's going to shift the burden. And unfortunately, the suggestion is that it's going to shift it more to the employee than to the employer. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm approaching this, as you can tell, with, with some misgivings, and I'd like your reaction. Well, let, me, let me try and set the, the record straight. I would not for a moment argue that the problems with Medicare have anything to do with the administration costs. They do indeed process the claims, and that is what we're measuring when we talk about transaction costs. They do process the claims very well. If you go back to 1965 and, and read the testimony by the predecessors of those of us sitting here at the table, the concern with the Medicare program was it would be its unbridled utilization uh, as the population aged, as technology advanced, and more and more people came in into the system. We see the same thing happening uh, with, a, with an all-payer system that has no restrictions whatsoever on utilization by patients. We know that anything is free, is going, or appears to be free, is going to be used with uh, uh, much greater uh, frequency than something that individuals have to think about before doing. Our use of deductibles, and I would, would uh, uh, emphasize that they are non-disabling deductibles. Uh, we have progressive income tax, we have progressive everything else in this country, and we believe that there ought to be progressive payment uh, for the health care system in this country. A RAND study done not too long ago showed that the imposition of a non-disabling deductible on an insurance uh, policy would reduce utilization by 39 uh, percent without showing any significant effect on the health status of the population studied. Therefore, this becomes a, an extremely important cost containment uh, uh, mechanism for those who are able to, to afford it. Uh, for those who couldn't afford it, of course they shouldn't have deductibles or co-payments. Well, they do, though. I, I, that's a wonderful theory that I agree in. Uh, I agree completely, but the, uh, the co-payments and the deductibles are what's busting the budget in, in the families. Uh, that's what's causing the kind of problems that have led us to come back to the table. Uh, it's not uh, unbridled utilization, and I don't, I don't know uh, what a good co-payment or a good deductible looks like as opposed to a bad one. If the family can't afford it, uh, then they're out of luck. Uh, uh, and it's this, uh, this uh, unacceptable circumstance that's really leading a lot of people to do what uh, Congressman Stark of California pointed out, is that when you just talk about the system without the name that it's Canadian, people say that's, that's what we need. Uh, we can't achieve universality by merely modifying to create an employer-mandated system. I've got a particular case in my office in Detroit an employer with, with five workers uh, was telling us about her inability to provide health benefits to her staff, which include one mother who made less than $9,000 a year. Uh, that's too much for Medicaid benefits and couldn't, and they probably won't meet the eligibility requirements for the deductible waivers, can't pay out of pocket. And there's the typical case of somebody that's going to fall in the middle. They're doing it now, and uh, there won't be any way that the, uh, the proposal that the AMA brings to the table here is going to help that class of worker, uh, of which there are many. The, the, small, the small 
employers aren't going to be able uh, to handle this kind of system that I think that you've brought before us today. Now, the, the Health Access America proposal does discuss in some detail the very issues about which you speak. Uh, it requires, you know, pluralism has made this country great. Uh, the, the competition that has gone on has, has made our research institutes, institutions and our, our health care systems the envy of the world. Now, we have a lot of problems within, within this country. We believe very strongly that it makes sense to build upon the strengths of those, uh, uh, those procedures and fix what is broken rather than trying to change the whole culture of the United States, which is really quite different from that of, of Canada. An all-payer system may work very well for 26 million people, but when you talk about 250 million people uh, with far more violence, far more uh, uh, drug use, and, and the AIDS epidemic and the numbers of AIDS patients in this country are three times those in, in, in Canada, uh, can we really afford to place this in a, a single source all-payer system that then is able to ratchet as has happened with the DRG system for hospitals. When the DRG prospective payment system began, it was a perfectly adequate payment system. But as the budget problems have increased, that has been ratcheted down until if you believe the statistics from the American Hospital Association, there are a lot of hospitals in this country that are in economic difficulty, uh, that they are closing their emergency rooms because they can no longer handle the, the uncompensated care. And remember that the GAO report ends up in its, in its final statement saying that a reformed U.S. system should also retain and build upon the unique strengths of the existing structure. Well, that's precisely what we intend to do. But, uh, you know, you talk to me as if you don't know that there are 34 million people not getting care and tens of millions others with insurance uh, who aren't, aren't carrying it. So I don't see anything so sacred about a pluralistic system or any other kind because this is what we've come to fix. We're, we're not talking philosophically now. We're talking about the people that need service from a failed system. Uh, you approach it uh, from a philosophical point of view. I approach it from the little lady with uh, five employees whose, whose staff she cannot, uh, she's worried because this lady working for her is not going to qualify for Medicaid. She's She's over that and she can't qualify for anything else. So I can't tell her that in a pluralistic system, uh, things are, are, that's what America wants. When we have Pete Stark telling us when you take the labels off and say, here's what's in it. You know, there's nothing Canadian about the concept of universal coverage. That's not a Canadian notion uh, as opposed to an American notion. That wasn't invented there. there there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing Canadian about a single-payer system. That's not a peculiar northern uh, medical insurance invention. Uh, we're talking about what are those features. And so when you tell me that uh, crime and AIDS and violence is going to ratchet it up and that we have a far larger population, I quite agree with you, but we're talking about a $650 billion expenditure that we're, we're now examining about how we're going to rearrange it. So what we're talking about is the same money being used to eliminate some of the $67 billion in administrative costs. And so I, ca I can't buy into the fact that uh, a pluralistic system is a notion that should take precedence over the needs of Americans who are crying out for change. Well, I, I don't think you should assume for a moment that the American medical profession is unconcerned about the 33 million people that are uninsured. Every one of us at this table have been practicing physicians who have seen the consequences of that, and the American medical profession does want to see uh, this, these defects taken care of. Our concern is not that there be universal access. Everybody at this table, I think everybody in our medical profession agrees with the concept. Well, you the didn't question always is, agree how do you, the AMA how do you finance didn't always it? agree with that concept. Yeah. 
Beg didn't pardon? always. I say the AMA, the American Medical Association, has lately come to that agreement. That was not. That hasn't been always the case, and you know I, it. I, I and think so do the, I. The medical profession of this country have always been concerned about their patients. I don't. Think well, I, 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 I don't quarrel with that. But, but I think but, we have. But to the whole idea. The whole idea, Dr. Todd, is that we've come down to the crunch in America. Uh, I can't keep going back to my constituencies talking about pluralistic systems and, and what I don't like about Canada. Uh, I can take the labels off these programs and throw them away. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, if Canada never had this system, we'd still be in trouble and we'd be looking for some change. And, and that, to me, is what we're about right now. Yeah, and, yeah. and all I'm suggesting to you as we examine these variety of plans, and you have one, is that yours is going to continue the same problem. There is no, you, you've never once talked about restraining uh, medical fees, and I can understand why, uh, you tell me that the hospital fees, that the hospital costs aren't even going up, and that's contrary to uh, most of the evidence that we have here. That's the two places plus administrative costs that we need containment, and we have now proposals that will deal with that. So I, I would continue to review your testimony, the AMA's position, uh, the hospitals as well. Uh, but I think, I think we're going to have to break out of the stalls and try something new and different. Well, I hope, I hope you will study our proposal because our, to our way of thinking, the issue is not change. Clearly that has to occur. Uh, the issue is how best to accomplish that change. And I would remind you, you have to look at the history. Great Britain has had 45 years of a national health system, a single payer. They are now in the process of trying to find a way to privatize that because they can no longer afford it. They have already reached the uh, point where 700,000 individuals are waiting necessary surgical care in the United Kingdom today. They have severely limited the introduction of new technology uh, and do not give certain treatments that are routine in this country. So we're not talking about change, we're trying to look at change change that will perpetuate the best of our system. We have in our proposal at least 12 uh, items that would help restrain the cost and utilization and the diffusion of technology in this country. Uh, we're not unaware of the, the costs that are involved. Uh, the issue we are debating is whether a single payer that has absolute control over the dollars and cents, absolute control over the technology is really the best way for this country to go. Well, I knew somebody would bring up the English system sooner or later. Uh, I'm sorry that it was you because the English system does not have private choice, private doctors, private selection, and, and nobody has compared it to what we would want to adopt in this country in the first place. But, of course, it gives the old idea that the government is the bad guy, that uh, Medicare didn't work uh, when you, uh, you opposed it, your organization opposed it uh, in 65. Uh, you're still slamming it now, but we'll concede that its administrative costs are, are five times less than the private sector's administrative costs in handling these programs. So, uh, I respect your, your position and we want to keep the door open for dialogue, but I have to reject uh, uh, bringing up the English system as a, as a reason implied that we shouldn't want to examine the new courses that we're doing right now. I yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Todd, you said that um, 87 percent of the Americans are covered. Um, now that sounds pretty good, but there's still 13 percent that isn't. And as I understand the AMA proposal, you would uh, have this 87 percent, which is now covered, would continue to be covered through the employment-based insurance system, and then you have what you call a health access program. What makes you think that that health access program is going to bring in the other 13 percent? 
Because there are several, several factors involved. We have to, you know, clearly we're not talking about leaving the 87 percent insured under necessarily the, the same provisions under which they're insured. One of the keystones of the Health Access America program is, first of all, to define a level of health care to which every American ought to have access. You're going to have to do that no matter what system you, you put in place in this country. Then once you have done that, you have a much better idea of how much it is going to cost and what populations are going to need support. We, we favor federalizing uh, Medicaid to develop standard eligibility requirements, standard benefits so that every citizen in every state can expect to get the same level of, of care. And for those who are uninsurable, uninsu working uninsured and are above the poverty level. And we would talk about state risk pools. There are 26, 27 states in this country now that have uh, insurance risk pools in order to uh, provide uh, community rate coverage for those who need it. Uh, by far, the great percentage of people are insured under their employees. Recent poll employer, recent poll done by the American Medical Association showed that 80 percent of the respondents favored continuing the employment-based uh, hospital uh, health insurance in this country. Well, under the um, <coughs> GAO report, they indicated that the hospital costs, the insurance costs, and the doctor costs in the United States had gone up substantially higher than um, in the United States. And we've only covered 87 percent. And now what you're saying is, well, let's give it back to the federal government, the other 13 percent, and we'll have some sort of a system that will take care of those, those people who've fallen through the, the so-called crack. But the point is that there's a lot of, of people that have fallen through that crack. And I'm not sure that your health access program is going to cover it. Well, we're not suggesting that all of that 13 percent be uh, given back to the, to the government. Uh, there's that area in the, in the risk pool management group where considerable numbers could be, uh, could be covered without having to come under government programs. Well, what's a risk pool? It's where all the insurance uh, companies in a state uh, set up a risk sharing uh, activity and, and uh, spread the risk across the uh, Well, what would be, who, who, would, who would be the, uh, the beneficiaries of that? Uh be the uninsurables who are now denied insurance because of pre-existing condition, the unemployed, and the who are above the the poverty uh, level, and the work unemployed, and the who are above the the poverty uh, level, and the working uninsured who have wouldn't been that be wouldn't that be creating more problems? Wouldn't that be counterproductive? Because you're going to set up a, a sort of a caste system for the. Uh people who are not uh, going to be covered uh, with the insurance uh, or with the employment-based insurance system. Well, part, part of the, the foundation of, of our Health Access America program mm -hmm is that the government for, should do for those who cannot do for themselves, and those who are able to take care of themselves should, so that this is a progressive system. All right, well, let, let me ask, uh, go on to another subject. Uh, <clears throat> technology control. Uh, we had some testimony on that uh, earlier. Um, we don't have any, quote, technology control, basically, in this country. And there is a lot of duplication, isn't there? And that's expensive. I mean, every hospital wants to have a CAT scan. Every hospital wants to have every, uh, every latest uh, technology breakthrough. And uh, the result is that there's an awful lot of duplication. There's a lot of expense. And uh, unless there's some sort of a system that would, um, that would uh, control that type of thing, it seems to me that this is another one of those um, um, areas in which costs can't be controlled at all. Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's fair to say there's no technology assessment in this country. We have the Federal Office of Technology Assessment. The American Medical Association has a whole department of technology assessment uh, using uh, 2,500 physicians across the country to ex assess new technology. And we report these uh, assessments to the insurance company, and in some instances, payment then is no longer made. Well, for the only technology, assessment. I mean, the only, the only system we have uh, in, uh, to uh, control it is inability to pay or inability to be covered. That, that's the only, uh, only difference we have. In other words, if you can't afford it, well, then, 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 then you, don't get the, you don't get the benefit of the system. 
Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. The, the technology assessment and the, and the payment for it are, are one and the same. Uh, you know, the, well, the no, they're not. But the point I'm making is that um, in this country, there are many people denied the, the coverage because they are not able to pay or because they're not employed or whatever. And so they're not getting the technology that, that's being provided. And um, in, in essence, um, that's being paid for. It's, it's duplicative and, and it's cost, it's, it's very costly and that there is no control. I mean, aside from what you said with regard to the federal government, I, I don't know of any, um, any um, uh, decision making body that says uh, X hospital shall get a CAT scanner and, and uh, Y hospital shall not. Nobody does that even in the state. No, you're, ab you're absolutely true. I, I, you are I mean, right. Shouldn't we have something like that? Uh, we had it I mean, for wouldn't a while. that be it helpful? Was, it was called certificate of need and it was finally abandoned because it didn't seem to, to fulfill the, no, the need. Certificate of need was something else. I mean I understand what that was all about. Certificate of need had to be, uh, uh, I mean, that was used in the, in the definition of physician services, and uh, I think that was, um, I think that was very faulty the way it was used. Uh, I don't think, I mean, that's not the solution in my judgment to, to what we're talking about. We're talking about more and more hospitals adding costs because they have to have all of these extra uh, um, um, uh, added features. Uh, so that they can compete with the next hospital, and it's a very competitive market out there. And, and everybody and wants to have, I, I ask uh, Mr. Slouten, uh, Slouten, who was here uh, from the Toronto General Hospital, I ask him about the um, um, person who, for example, in, in my district, there's a hospital in a little town of Sodas. There's also some hospitals in Rochester. Well, it's a lot easier to go to SOTUS. Everybody wants to go to SOTUS Hospital. So the, SOTUS has got to have all of the equipment and everything else right with that in, in our system. And that is, is pretty costly. If those people could uh, go to Rochester, they would have that and we wouldn't have that kind of duplication. But nobody's, nobody and no organization and there's no procedure today in the federal government or the state governments that says, well, we're not going to spend that extra money. We're going to provide better patient care and that sort of thing. And uh, that's one of the cost containment areas that I think uh, is somewhat faulty in, in our system. And I'm not, I'm not pushing for the, for the Canadian system. I, I think it was helpful for us to have that analysis and I think it's helpful to have it. But I think that it's going to be helpful if, if the Americans who participate in this program, and certainly physicians do, hospitals uh, participate, insurance companies participate, um, and then their patients, their people. Uh, we're going to have to have some kind of a system that's going to give uh, coverage to everybody. Um, your system, I, I have some very um, uh, serious questions as to whether the health access program that would cover the rest of them is going to do that. And I, I would hope that the, that the Medical Association would took a, take a hard look at that and try to come up with something that you feel can be constructive and can be helpful as this dialogue goes on because I think as I said earlier and I'm sure you were here we're going to have to move on this I think in this Congress it's a it's a very serious problem. Well I appreciate very much what you're saying Mr. Horton and I, I share many of your your feelings technology assessment and introduction does need to have some controls placed upon it but you know in many respects we live in a somewhat schizophrenic society there is a city in this country uh, where one hospital had an MRI machine and the other hospital didn't. A severe trauma patient was brought to the hospital who did not have the MRI. The patient was transported across the city to get the MRI to find out what was going on within the injured skull to be cared for, and the original hospital was sued because it didn't have an MRI. So, you know, the, the, all of this has to, has to fit together. There are these uh, major cultural differences. From the point of view of the American Medical Association, Health Access America has been our best shot based on what we believe is the tradition of America and the, the issues that need to be addressed. But let me also assure you, the American Medical Association is not going to be slow to look at any proposal or possibility that's going to improve access to health care and make it more efficient, restrain costs, and give us better outcomes than we're, we're doing now. But this is our, our initial best shot that says we believe 
based on the, the history of this country, based on the needs of this country, uh, and based on the fact that for the last eight years, we have been living in a competitive society that says compete, compete, compete. Uh, and uh, as you have suggested, uh, that competition has to be changed. But competition is, in some respects, healthy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chris Chase for the final questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank all four of you gentlemen for being here. I, uh, I feel I owe three of you an apology because, um, uh, Mr. Todd, you basically have taken, the, Dr. Todd, you've basically taken a position that's a little against the, the flow of the hearing we've had, and so it's, it seems logical that we would be asking you the questions, but I, I welcome anyone else jumping in. Um, it, I am, I'm trying to wrestle with the fact, I, I believe we're going to have universal coverage, and I, I just see the movement in a whole host of different ways. I, I see many different parts all moving in the same direction. What I, I'm not convinced of is that we'll have a system that will be beneficial when we're done. Um, and, and that's what concerns me. And it seems to me that, that, that even the MAA, uh, the Medical Association in particular, is going to, uh, American Medical Association is going to have to make sure that they're not left out of the loop um, and, and therefore don't have the influence that might be helpful to this process. Um, one of the things that concerns me is just trying to determine who is the winner and who is the loser. In other words, who is ultimately going to pay and, and who is going to get away with not having to pay whereas before they were paying. Um, retirement systems, uh, you know, businesses have committed, some businesses have committed that they will pay uh, the retirement benefit, health care benefits of their employees, and some haven't. Um, and it just, I'm, I'm, you don't have the answer to this question necessarily, but it's going to be one that we're going to have to wrestle with. I guess um, the, the, the question I want to ask you is, uh, just a few, but, but first, the uninsured are receiving some health care services. They receive health care services when they go to the hospital and they have an acute need. A hospital does not turn someone away. Uh, that says the hospitals pick up the cost and pass it on to those who are insured. Uh, is that a true statement? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Do all of you agree with that statement? Okay. Uh, so what are the uninsured not getting? What is the, just briefly, I mean, I, we, there's probably a long list, but what are they not getting? Well, let me, let me first respond to the fact that I, I think we agree with you that we are going to have a national system of access. I'm, I'm reluctant to call it national health insurance because that has some connotations that go back to another area. But I, we believe and are firmly committed to trying to work toward universal access. Now, in terms of what the uninsured aren't getting, they're not getting early access to care. They're not getting preventive care. They're not getting the inoculations. They're not getting uh, uh, prenatal care. They're not getting uh, child health care. Mm -hmm. uh, they are getting late to the physician. Uh, they're not getting the, the mild hypertension, the early diabetes, a whole series of things are not being treated until they can no longer uh, get along without seeking some sort of, of care. And then they go to the, the hospitals of last resort, which are those uh, predominantly, such as Dr. Young is in, in, in Dr. Addington, are involved in, in, in Chicago that are publicly sponsored because the uncompensated care load has made it very difficult uh, for the proprietary hospitals to provide any more of that uncompensated care. What you have just said is obviously the strongest statement for why we need universal health care coverage. Um, I'm left with a, a question as it relates to, I mean, I, besides the cost, the, the other issue that, that concerns me the most, first off, D Dr. Todd, you made a very accurate statement, and I think, and, and expressed a very legitimate concern about whether our government will live up to its obligations. One of them is that Medicaid and Medicare do not cover the full cost of the services provided. And uh, I've had physicians who have expressed tremendous uh, anger to me when someone drives down in a limousine, gets out of the limousine, and then becomes a Medicare patient. And, and, and yet that physician is asked to basically uh, reduce his or her rate to service that person who literally drove down in a limousine. Um, but the questions that I, I'm having a hard time, and so the government chooses not to fully fund Medicare and Medicaid for two reasons. One is a legitimate reason to control costs. 
uh, and to encourage hospitals to do it for less and doctors to do it for less. That's legitimate. The other is simply we have a budgetary crisis, so we say simply we're not going to make the hard decision of putting the money up front and paying for it. And I guess the concern I have is that what is to say that that won't continue after we adopt this, this universal coverage? The other issue, though, I have, it, it strikes me, is that we simply, in order to be successful uh, in the sense that the Canadians have been successful, I would call it relatively successful, we are literally going to have to decide who gets what in hospitals, what technical equipment will be where. We're also going to have to decide um, within the medical profession what, uh, who can be a specialist and who can't, or if you are a specialist, are you legitimately allowed to charge more? And I see tremendous battles there. I'm struck with the fact that we're going to have to tell drug companies that they can't uh, continue to increase the cost of something they've already developed and then say it costs 20 percent more when they've already done all the research and yet they, they realize they're the only show in town and, and they charge more. Uh, and we are going to be putting a lot of insurance companies out of business. Uh, other than that, it's going to be a very easy task. Um, <laughs> And in the, what concerns me in this process is that, that uh, in making these decisions, compromise is going to be the result, and we will have tried to create a horse, and it will look like a camel. Um, and obviously, I guess um, that's a concern that all of us have. Um, well, let me, let, let me, if I could, uh, yeah. Congressman, let me turn the coin over. You talk about the deductibles and co-pays that have been uh, steadily increased in the, in the Medicare program because of the increasing expense. You turn the coin over, and uh, that's been done across the board, and the government has not shown sensitivity in protecting the poor elderly. And there are poor elderly for whom the deductibles and, and co-pay mm -hmm. are indeed a burden. And what we're trying to develop is a health care system that is responsive to the multiple demands and needs of the individual that are, that are going to have to, to seek care in the future. When you talk about specialists, and we from the AMA cannot talk about health manpower, we're going to get a prompt call from the Federal Trade Commission, so we, we need to leave that to, to, to your concern. Uh, but you're right, it is going to be very difficult, and you, you asked earlier, were there going to be winners or losers? Uh, we would hope that there would be a lot of winners, that is, those who are currently uh, uninsured, uh, who lack access to the system, but that the losers would really be those who to, ought to be participating today and who really are not participating in, in helping achieve affordable health care for all. I, I, I guess what I'm leading to, though, in terms of who pays is that um, that I just want to make sure that people today who are paying for the system who can afford to pay for the system will. And it is hard for me to visualize um, a way we will find, in other words, we are, the statement that has been made in both of our hearings has been that there's a set amount that we spend on health care. And if we have an all-payer system, we will not have to spend more because we will make savings and therefore include the uninsured in the system. And that makes logical sense to me, but where I'm having my trouble is deciding where we get who pays for this service ultimately. How are we going to, in a sense, tax the American people uh, so that we can do that? And, I, I, and my biggest concern is how do we control costs? And I, and I would welcome some other gentlemen. Yes, sir. The, um, the issue of uh, costs uh, and containment has been well addressed by the American College of Physicians. and. Uh, Certainly, the uh, overutilization of expensive tests and adding a uh, second MRI only increases that. Uh, we have developed practice gu guidelines. We strongly advocate that, as pointed out in the uh, Canadian system, where they have 50 percent primary care physicians, and in this country we're around 30 percent, uh, we should emulate uh, Canada. Um, and also, perhaps most fundamentally, uh, there should be health care planning. Um, uh, regions uh, should plan uh, expensive equipment like the lithotriptor example of uh, Toronto. I, I feel very strongly that the uh, medical expertise is available in this country uh, where consensus can be reached about uh, technology utilization. And this would, uh, this would improve uh, access, it would save uh, a tremendous amount of money and is long overdue in the competitive, non-planned environment that now exists. May I take a shot at your question? Yes. Okay. okay. Let's hold for just one moment, Dr. Young. Okay.
change John, here. Yeah. John, I have five more minutes in the next five minutes. Five more minutes? Yeah, that's all I know. Certainly, you, you don't object to that considering. Uh, I think you're asking highly pertinent questions, and I like them most of all because there's a presumption we're going to get where we have to go. As to the very important question of the vulnerability of the health budget to the other demands of, of our, our national system, I think that's valid, and uh, I would suggest uh, that, that it be isolated uh, even better than the Social Security funds, that the sources of payment be identified, and I'll give you a list in a minute, and that that money be untouchable ratcheting down and other tricks that you've played on the system should not be possible in that sense. Uh, I, and I commend, you can get off what I'm going to say in the next 30 seconds in a superb article in the J JAMA, Journal of Medical, Medical Association, May 15th by Grunbach et al., which has our proposal on the sources of money and shows that it's essentially a transfer. The government today spends not as much as uh, Congressman Oker said, but 42 percent of all the money comes from government sources, mostly federal, of course. An additional 10 percent at least comes from the tax structure, which excuses uh, medical expenditures in various ways from taxation. So you, you're, you're well over half. Of course, the, the biggest other one is the employer-based uh, arrangements, which are very variable and, one, and most tragic in the small employer who just can't afford it, and yet a, a huge variation among the big employers, some of whom get unfair competitive advantage from this very fact. And it, we haven't talked a lot today about the destabilization of our larger economy. It's been implied, but it's very important. To, to summarize, as I say, in 30 seconds, the government monies would still be forthcoming. Uh, we would propose to reduce the total from uh, payroll and employers by 12 percent from 259 billion to 228. There's a bonanza, a winner. Some, of course, who are paying nothing will have to get in the game. Uh, and we, uh, this is a, a simply a payroll tax of 9 percent on employers and 2 percent for employees. And for those with less than 20 employees, half that rate. And uh, we know that. Uh, We've just, you've, you've pointed out, or the report points out, $67 billion we now have that we didn't have before by savings. That's not new money. It's old money now available for good use rather than waste. Uh, we also have some syntaxes, although we don't propose to let tell me the just say, I can get those lists. Um, okay. I, yeah, I, so let, let me the, just focus in on the, on the, I'm sorry, sir, if you want uh, to just finish up. Well, it's just that, and uh, I think you, you'll see it's doable. I do want to reiterate what I said before as we get closer to, Mr. Chairman, to the solution to this problem. We have to safeguard those monies. The point made about vulnerability to other demands is very valid. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to make that mistake. The, these are the last two questions I have, and I think we can finish up fairly quickly. The, the, the issue that I have to resolve as this one member of Congress is the recognition that if you have an all-payer, one-payer, uh, and no co-payments, you have obviously less paperwork. But I basically agree with Dr. Todd's comment, uh, which, which I, I mean, I strongly agree that a service that we have that is free m will be used more than it should. And the question is, by having an income-sensitive deductible, uh, will we encourage cost containment more than by simply not having the deductible and not having the administrative costs of, of, of the, you know, having the deductible? You know, the trade-off between the two. That's one question. Yeah, that, that's a tough one to answer, but from, from, from our point of view, it would seem that, you know, it, it, again, you can't isolate any one of these items. We clearly have to have reform of, of the insurance industry. No, and, if you could just answer the question. Place. The question is this. If you have a deductible, do we add um, more paperwork costs than we save by encouraging, with a deductible, encouraging people not to use the service as much? Or in the end, is it just better simply to have no co-payment because we'll have less co-administrative costs? That's the question. I'm, I'm, if you don't have a, a sense of an answer either way, then... I, I really yeah, I can't reach a judgment on that. Do, do any of you have a sense of what... I, I really emphatically think 
the negative is the correct answer. You gain nothing by the deterrent. There's no way to say that that copayment, insofar as it inhibits use, will not inhibit the person who really needs it. There's no way that uh, no study shows that it, it's an invisible hand that just cuts the unnecessary. And that, to me, I'm a practicing physician. I don't see unnecessary utilization, even patients who are well insured. There's a disease called hypochondriasis, which is a disease. Doctor, I, I know that if, if I didn't have to go to the dentist, I wouldn't. But we do know, uh, I'm not going to get drilled if I don't have to get drilled, but we do know that people overutilize health service. I mean, that's something so, so uh, documented that you lose credibility when you make that well, statement. Well, I, I would wish we had the time. I sense you have to, <laughs> you all have to vote. I feel I could make the case, and emphatically, based on not only my personal experience, but others, there are abuses of the system, but uh, they are, I think, primarily provider abuses. And uh, patients, uh, in my experience, who are well-educated and understand the needs, who are not in that small group of people who are over-utilizers because they have a disease, don't do it. And I'd like you to test the other doctors here. We're all practicing physicians. The, the, the last question, uh, do you have a comment? Yes. yes. I'm a practitioner, have been all my life, even though I'm on the faculty at Duke, very is, is your institution. I think it is on. It might, yeah. might not be close enough to the mic. Pull it closer. I thought it was on. Uh, Congressman Shea to really get at the heart of deductible versus what we are trying to do on our side is reduce the barrier. You see, we see the patients like they really live in the communities where they are, and the more barriers you put up, uh, unlikely, you see, many, most Americans, as you have to come to recognize, have a terrible hostility toward means testing to achieve anything. And therefore, many of them will not accept Medicaid. They'd rather be sick and die first, Congressman. In the Constitution of this country, it says life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and providing for the general welfare, of which the congressmen and senators are charged under the Constitution to provide adequate health care with no barriers. That's number one. The barriers should be on the basis of the provider who knows what is necessary and determine in his own best judgment and not have someone trying to legislate or determine at a distance what each person needs. That would be an impossibility in a country of over 200 million folks. The question is, how do we remove the barriers where no one dies or have adequate access to health care? I just cited for you, the Health and Human Services has documented the death of 60,000 minorities, and I'm sure there are others that are not included, who do not have ordinary access to health care. And the reason they don't have it, for the very reason we're here now discussing it, and we increase more barriers, you'll see, more deaths for the simple reason the person won't go to it because they don't want to be mean tested. I understand the way you're asking the question, but I think all the deductibles and everything else should be removed and everyone should have access to health care and that's all they need to know wherever they are in this country. They can go to any hospital, any doctor, and that's the end of the discussion. Let me just say to you, Dr. It is the end of the discussion in one sense, and I, I understand that we could use a lot of, uh, we could take life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and justify a lot of government expenses, but I will not be able to provide and help the people you want to be helped if we don't find a way to control costs. And I just, and I just make that point to you. I, I want you to know I want universal coverage, and I would like it as quickly as possible. I want it to be a system that works and that later on we're not clamoring to repeal because it's so expensive because we were irresponsible in not containing costs. I think, uh, very briefly, the, the answer uh, that I would give would be if you had the proper system that was properly governed, that co-payments would be unnecessary in the part of cost containment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a nice You're more than hearing. welcome. You're more than welcome. Gentlemen, we thank you. Uh, your views are divergent, but then so are ours. Uh, this is only the second hearing. Uh, we've got to examine uh, a lot of our statements. Uh, we're going to uh, continue our research. And uh, I think this has been a very helpful dialogue for the American people in terms of how we move away from a system that's obviously in big trouble. And I thank you for your time and your cooperation. Committee stands adjourned. That concludes our coverage of Tuesday's hearing of the House Government Operations Committee. Here is a reminder now to be with us later this morning for live C-SPAN coverage of a hearing of the Senate Armed Services Committee. 
Members will meet to examine the U.S. role in the Persian Gulf War and to hear testimony from General Norman Schwarzkopf, commander of Allied forces during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. That's all live beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 6 a.m. for our West Coast viewers. Coming up next, a presidential classroom with the United States Senator and Minority Leader Robert Dole of Kansas. This week on Book Notes. Everybody thinks the earth is warming up because everybody says so, but they never give you any evidence. What are the facts? Do they do these stories?